Make sure you download the Woodward Sports app in the App Store and the Google Play Store today. Take Woodward Sports with you wherever you go and listen live on your phone or mobile device. Sports Network featured on the Roar 93.5 FM, 99.1 FM, and 94.7 HD2. Happy to have you here. It is Friday. We had Thursday night football last night. We've got Friday night football tonight with our high schools, and we've got college tomorrow, and obviously NFL Sundays, so lots to look forward to this weekend, lots of football. Happy, happy Friday, everyone. We have made it to the end of the week. And I'm excited, so I know my guy Fish is excited in his booth as well. Yep, we're getting a fist fist bump right now. He can't see it, but. Just waiting for the day Fish shows up here on a Monday with the same energy he shows up on Friday. <laughs> It'll happen eventually, I'm sure. But that being said, the Washington football team somehow pulled out a one-point win last night over the New York Giants, who had every opportunity to win that game. It. It was insane. I almost shut off the game multiple times, but I'm really glad that I stuck around and watched through to the end. That being said, I want to get your guys' take on last night, but I also want to get your guys' take on Kenny Galladay because after what I saw from him last night and the little temper tantrum that he threw on the sideline, I don't miss him at all. So, Jeff, I want to get your take from last night. Yeah, well, the first thing I noticed about last night was, let's talk about Taylor Heineke. Uh, 46 pass attempts, completed 34 of them. 336 yards, two TDs, in a pick he threw uh, towards the end of the game. But my God, uh, I, I was over here calling him, listen, if they could run the football and, and Taylor can just manage this game and not turn the ball over, the man attempted 46 passes. All right, He, he came out, he was two for two on fourth down. Uh, Antonio Gibson, he was 13 for 69, uh, no touchdowns. I did say he'd be important in this game. That he, They were running the ball uh, situationally and enough to where Taylor Heineke Listen, man, he, could, he was airing it out. Uh, but what, what stands out to me is this time last year, Taylor Heineke was taking classes. He, he was in school part-time while he was a, a backup quarterback or a third-string quarterback. And then he started against uh, the, the Super Bowl champions, Tampa Bay, and put on a show. And I think that's what he arose to fame from. And considering where he's at now, my God, uh, it, it's, it's awesome to see like his progression as a quarterback because – you know, the minute you attempt 40 plus passes, you know, and, and made some incredible throws. You saw the the pass to uh, Ricky Seals Jones in the end zone. Uh, it was a, it was a perfect dime. It was either Ricky was getting it or was going out of bounds. Um, but besides Taylor Heineke, the Giants essentially did get robbed. Uh, it is their fault, by the way. If Dexter doesn't commit that penalty at the end of the game, they're going home winners. Uh, the, obviously, he missed the 50 something uh, yard field goal. Dexter Lawrence committed the penalty. They got to uh, kick a, a a closer one. And it, it's like the 51 uh, yard. It didn't even count. They, they sunk it. Uh, Washington won the football game. But, you know, and you can also count back to when Daniel Jones ran for that 58 yard touchdown. And essentially they had a, another penalty, which got called back, which would have put them out 13 7. So the Giants just made a lot of mental mistakes. But nonetheless, it was a great Thursday night football game. Um, uh, if I had to take one thing away from this game, is, is it, what shocks me is how you know, passive this uh, Washington football team defensive front was because the Giants offensive line is, as much as it hurts to say this, they played pretty well last night. Uh, they lost Nick Gates. He, he broke it. Obviously, had the, the horrible, horrible leg injury. Um, if you guys saw that picture, it was absolutely disgusting. But, um, yeah, the, the Washington football team, they played well versus the Chargers. Kept it close. Coming out to the Giants, and they give up 29 to a Daniel Jones who um, looked like Vanilla Vic out there. He had uh, <laughs> almost 100 yards, and uh, he was cooking. So that, that, that's the one thing that stood out to me is, is this Washington defensive, uh, defensive front. The secondary looked good in the late. They, they made Kelly Yalde very upset multiple times. Um, I think that he, they, Kenny was targeted like nine or ten times, and he only caught like three balls. So they, they were roughing him up. But, you know, it is what it is. It was a fantastic uh, Thursday night football game. And um, each, you know, the last Thursday, this Monday – They've all been great. So you, you, as a football fan, you can't complain. Uh, it just, it's, we essentially got what we expected. Washington won, but just in a weird fashion, Adam. That's how, that's how I describe uh, not it. Not weird fashion, spectacular fashion. That was a great football game. <laughs> Thursday night opener, week one, the Cowboys lose by one. Tom Brady leads the team down the field. I believe with a minute 13 left, they win the game. And here comes Taylor Heineke. Oh, my <laughs> leads God. Leads the team downfield after probably one of the worst play calls I've seen since... The Russell Wilson slant route call in the Super Bowl. Like, you ran it. Antonio Gibson was averaging almost 
near five yards of carry, a little over five yards of carry, actually. And he goes, he gets you about three or four yards. It was somewhere between those two. And on second down, after the two-minute warning, you, you come out, or right before the two-minute warning, you come out, I believe, with 222 left. You line up in shotgun, and you're, you're putting the ball in a, in a quarterback's hands that this is only his third NFL start. You may like Taylor Heineke, but he was bailed out a lot last night by yeah. his wide receivers. How many times did he throw a ball, and you're like, oh, my goodness, he overthrew it. It's too high. It's too high. It's too like." Both quarterbacks were just sloppy last night. It didn't it didn't show up in the turnover column, but I just feel both teams overall didn't execute enough. If this was a well executed game, this definitely goes under. It doesn't go anywhere near forty points if the game plans were executed the way they were. There was just broken down coverage from both Washington and from and from New York on both sides. Taylor uh, Terry McLaurin absolutely lit the Giants secondary. Eleven receptions. Giants offered zero pass rush. They got to Taylor Heineke in multiple instances, but, you know, Heineke just, he, he wasn't great. It wasn't anything special. Uh, to make that decision to go for it, not go for it, but throw the football, and, and that moment was just one of the dumbest things I've seen, especially this year. It's hands down the worst play call of the year. They got very fortunate. One, they received the ball back, obviously. They were able to hold New York to only a field goal, waste all of their timeouts except one, move the ball back downfield, and, of course, we all know what happened. The offsides at the end won a lot of people money, lost a lot of people money. <laughs> That's the fun part about sports betting. If you had the Washington football team, you're absolutely going crazy, enjoying and celebrating the night. If you had the Giants, well, tough luck. Tough luck. That's why you cash out early sometimes. Um, my star of the game, T Terry McLaurin. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. 11 catches, over 100 yards, two touchdowns. Oh, I'm not two touchdowns. He had one. I had one touchdown. No. Sterling Shepard on the other side is just molding into really a better pass option for, for Daniel Jones than Kenny Galladay is right now. Kenny Galladay, yes, targeted, what, nine times? Yep. Regardless, the passes weren't all that great. They were in tight windows in the middle of the field. Well, Kenny Galladay is supposed to make those catches. Well, yeah, it's easy to say that when, when you're not Kenny Galladay and... You don't have Daniel Jones throwing to you. So I think if it, both teams learned anything from last night is they have core pieces that you like. I think it's both teams have good rosters. They're not great. They're not contending, you know, rosters, but they're, they're pretty close. Washington, much closer than New York, but they're both a quarterback away. They're both a quarterback away. I'm not happy with the quarterback situation for either team. Daniel Jones, he can play great against Washington all he wants. He's 4-19 and 19 against every other team, and now he's 4-1 and one against Washington. Ran for 95 yards. Great. That's not what I want from my quarterback. Justin Herbert's not running for 95 yards. Justin Herbert isn't falling down short of a third, line, uh, third down marker. Like, this guy, or first down marker, this guy, Daniel Jones, is unbelievably bad. I'm sorry. He's just awful. And Taylor Heineke is a nice backup. Daniel Jones may emerge into a nice backup. Somebody you want to have. But he's not going to change your franchise. And neither is Taylor Heineke. So, really, the biggest thing I took away from watching that game is both teams need a franchise quarterback. They're nowhere, they're nowhere in a position to compete long-term if they don't figure out the quarterback situation, right? On Washington, you have the running back. You kind of have the offensive line put together. You definitely have the defensive line put together. You have Terry McLaurin. You have Logan Thomas. He's nice. But, They're you know, quarterback you probably away. probably need another wide receiver. De'Ami Brown isn't, isn't all that. Move to the defensive side of the ball. We all know about the defensive line. The secondary is okay. You get a franchise quarterback in there. You're, you're really the best team in your, in your division right away if you just get the quarterback right. You want to mm -hmm. talk about teams that should be lining up to make a move for Deshaun Watson? New York and Washington both have to be in the market, and I think Washington would be the more appealing destination for Deshaun Watson. I think they could give up the assets needed to get him, but back to the game. Jeff, I, I believe you had the Giants winning, correct? No, I had Washington winning. You had winning. Giants covering? It was one of the two. No, I, I, I believe, I said the Giants, they need to stop Listen, I'm like, make Heineke air this thing out, and he had some bad passes, but, I mean, he was 34 for 46, so it kind of worked out. But I saw the Washington uh, football team winning. I just thought their pass rush would be too much for Daniel Jones. I didn't think the offensive line would actually hold Chase Young to, I believe, zero sacks. Uh, it, it just didn't sound um, likely to me, but nonetheless, still lost. Um in their in their fault a lot of their own mistakes 
But yeah, you, you hit it right on the head. Both these teams are going to be in, in competition for a quarterback. Like, uh, you know, I like Taylor Heineke. A lot, a lot of people do, but it doesn't matter the fact that he's going to be your franchise uh, starter. But Daniel Jones, he's had plenty of opportunities. I think the nine r- carries for 95 yards could have been 10 carries for over 100 if that one counted. But I agree. I don't like my quarterback running the football as much, especially when you have other guys. It's more of a, an instinct. Like he'll... Once he hikes the ball, it's almost like a split-second decision. I'm going to take off. Um, it, it's instead of sitting in the pocket, he doesn't really trust. I feel like he gets he gets very very overwhelmed in the pocket. Like there was a time where Daniel Jones, when he hiked the ball, I think Sterling Shepard was wide open on on a curl route. No one was on him at all. No man coverage. It was like soft coverage, and he he just ate it. He ate a sack. He, he didn't stand up in the pocket and make a throw. Um, he, he's just second guessing himself a lot. And and. As a third-year player, it's not a good thing. Uh, he had a great rookie year, but what? I mean, what are you going to say? They, they both are going to be in the running for a quarterback, and it's uh, it, you know Taylor Heineke just got the best of them, and uh, I mean it is what it is. I think I Cowboys know. still win think, the division, but I, I think both coaches really put their teams out there to. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Why didn't, didn't the Giants like... go for two? That was the big thing. They went for they just kicked a field goal and they lost by I one. Think in hindsight, it's um, it's a good question. Uh, you should in that situation, regardless. But I mean, if they don't kick a few, if they don't and they go for two, it's they're still only up by one. So they the risk the risk was they were gonna go down and kick a field goal anyway. So why not go for two? I I don't know. I I don't understand. They they basically had no run game. Saquon yeah. Barkley may need another two, three, four weeks before we can even consider him kind of back to normal. He busted out what forty one yard that was it run early and that was it. That was it. So disappointing night. Disappointing night for both teams. If you walk away, you're not happy if you're a Giants fan or a Washington football fan. If you're on Washington's side, your defense looks nothing like what you'd expect it to be. And if you're New York, you're 0-2. Daniel Jones is still your quarterback. And you're kind of wasting, you know, nice pieces. So, you know, Dave, Dave, Gettleman, Dave Gettleman needs to go. He is the first GM that should get fired this year for the uh, in the NFL, uh, the New York Giants GM. Long time coming. Like to pay Kenny Galladay wide receiver one money was probably one of the dumbest things I've seen in the offseason. And then draft a wide receiver. And then draft a wide receiver in the first round. Like how dumb can you be? Like I usually I don't like to sit up here and, and bash people, but some days it's just warranted. <laughs> Dave Gettleman needs to be fired. Before the trade deadline. Mm-hmm. I don't want him being my GM if I'm a Giants fan. Going into the offseason. Let alone... the. I, I just don't... Get him away from me. Get him away from me. What has he done outside of bust every single draft pick he's made? Mm-hmm. What has he done? The Joe Judge hire, I kind of like it. I think so far I've seen like nice things from Joe Judge. He can coach. His teams don't make really uh, many fundamental mistakes. They're they're tough to play against. Even if you beat them, they kind of they're a pain in the butt to beat. But <laughs> Dave Gottman needs to go. Besides Odell, right? That's the only pick he really hit on. It's been nothing. I don't know. I don't even know if you consider Odell Beckham a hit. At least in New York, it was a hit. Uh, let's just. I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> but yeah, Dave Gottman needs to go. I, I mean, come on, Daniel Dave, Jones. Dave Gottman needs to get out of New York. You want to talk yeah. about like. People that are on the hot seat, it's Dave Gettleman. They should have fired him when they fired uh, Pat Shermer. When you Shermer. draft Daniel Jones over the quarterbacks that were available in that draft, you took him sixth overall. Sixth. Goodbye. I like that is, you know, there are things that you can save your job with by doing, and there are just things like, you, even, even if you outperform my expectations of you, I have this like black mark of you that I just can't get out of my head. And with Dave Gettleman, it's the Daniel Jones pick. I will never unsee it. I will never forgive it. Or the Andrew Thomas pick. Let's not even go there. <laughs> <laughs> so, sorry. No. It was a great football game, though. Great yeah, you can't ask for a better game. Uh, it gave you everything you want. It gave you a high-scoring game. It gave you the, the anticipation, the anxiety of, like, oh, my goodness, what's going to happen? It was a great football game all around, Kennedy. What would you make of it? Like I said... New York had every chance to win, and they blew it. And the whole Kenny Galladay thing, I was like, honestly, thank God we don't have to deal with that anymore. So I was happy with it. Like you said, not much more you can ask from a football game. So, yeah, was glad that I stayed up through the whole thing. But coming up next, we're going to talk some Lions, so stick around from, for that. But before we go, can we hear about our friends over at Northwestern Tech, Jeff? 
Yeah, hopefully Daniel Jones he's, doesn't need to get a job here. Oh, All no, right. Dave Gettleman. Dave Gettleman. Yeah, definitely right. Dave Gettleman. So, listen, you can start a new career in an industry that is always essential, uh, the heating and cooling industry. Learn more today by visiting northwesterntech.edu. Welcome to the Call Sam Chopper Shop, where you can win a custom-built chopper while helping our veterans at the same time. Watch as the Bad Pig Custom Team turns this bike into a one-of-a-kind classic chopper. And when it's finished, we'll be donating the bike to Volunteers of America Michigan to raffle off in support of our vets. A great cause to give back to those who've given so much. Watch for Call Sam Chopper Shop episodes on our social media channels and get your raffle ticket today at callsam.com backslash chopper shop. Welcome back, everybody. You're tuning into the Morning Wood on the Woodward Sports Network. Happy to have you here. It's Friday. You have made it to the end of the week. Congratulations. All right, so we're going to talk about Panay Sewell and ho the hopes that we have, I know that we have in this room, for him to stay at left tackle. But before we get into that, I need to tell you guys how you can come hang out with us for this upcoming Packers game. Join us Monday night for our Riff Rockin' Lions pregame show from 6 to 8 p.m. at O'Toole's in Royal Oak. Um, you know, the Jose Cuervo girls will be right there with us, and we will have those Cuervo drink specials. You guys know I hang out in the Cuervo zone, so come hang out with me. Get some Jose Cuervo. It'll be a lot of fun. Um, but, yeah, like I said, we're all in agreement here that Penny Sewell should stay at left tackle, right? That's fair to say, I think. Yes. And I think – that the majority of the fan base is right there with us based on what I've seen on social media. But O-line Hank, oh, O-line coach Hank Farley said, I've never seen Decker play right tackle. I just know this. If you ask any of our guys to do whatever, they'll go out and compete in wherever they go. But it's not even been brought up. So, Jeff, do you have any concerns that putting Decker at right tackle hasn't even been a discussion yet? Well, uh, I understand it's a complicated situation because you have an experienced veteran in Taylor Decker who hasn't played right tackle since uh, college at Ohio State. So he's comfortable there. He even said in, in, at the press conferences where our, our guy Corey Woods uh, attends, he said, my body's too adjusted to the left side. I, 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 he's 28 years old. He's been in the league five years or so. He's so used to, to starting at the left tackle position, he said it would be difficult for him to make that, that transition to the right. So with that being said, um, okay, so the Lions are in a tough predicament here. So th they, They're not. No, hold on. Let me, let me, let me finish this. He's 20. He, okay, you just, you just messed up my whole point. Now you got me all rattled. All right, let me remind you this. He's five seasons with Detroit. Um, he took his play to the next level last year at least. Career low in sacks, career low in penalties. Uh, but... He's never made a Pro Bowl at the left tackle. He's a, he's a very good left tackle. You say top 10, top 15, whatever you want to say. But Ryan Armani, our guy here at Woodward Sports, uh, is on the bottom line show 2-4. to four. He stated a very good fact. He said, Taylor Decker has never made a Pro Bowl in that, in that sense. But Frank Ragnow, let's tell a story about Frank Ragnow. All right, coming out of you know Arkansas, one of the best centers uh, collegiately. Uh, and once we draft him, obviously we had Graham Glo uh Glasno put him at center, put Frag, Frank Ragno at, at guard. Once we move Frank back to center, he was a he was a good right guard, serviceable, similar to what Penny Sewell could be at right tackle, very good right tackle. Once you made once you made the transition to move Frank Ragno back to his natural position at center, Pro Bowler, top uh, three center in the league. I mean, this guy has been our uh, you know our staple of our offensive line. So think about it like that. When Frank Ragnall made that transition, it was only it was the best thing that ever happened to his career. So why are we forcing Panay Sewell to, to play his a position he's never played, um, especially when we took him seventh overall, and you expect him, a lot of people expect, this guy has so much potential he could be all pro, you know, future Hall of Famer, all this stuff, and we're just going to force him to play the right tackle. It doesn't make any sense, in my opinion. Um, I mutually agree. The best thing is, is really to, to look for a trade for Taylor Decker. If he's unwilling to move to the right tackle spot, it makes zero sense to keep him and, and, and put Penney at the right side. This is why the Detroit Lions have sucked for 60 years. It's because of stupidity like this. What more do I have to say? You draft a generational, to, to quote the Lions front office, a generational type left tackle. Left tackle. You draft him. Seventh overall. He fell to you. When, when it was announced, you were high-fiving. You were slamming the table, screaming, fist-bumping. You were going crazy in the war room. And you move him to right tackle. And okay, like let's experiment. I'm okay with that. I don't mind that at all. And you see him in three preseason games, and he looks absolutely pitiful. 
Well, well that, that's not great. Uh, we'll, we'll keep him out there against San Francisco on the right side. Oh, Taylor Decker gets her blessing in disguise. And he goes on the left, and he actually plays a very good game. The highest PFF-rated rookie lineman, offensive lineman from week one. And he went against Nick Bosa and a San Francisco edge rush or defensive line that's just very talented. And you're now going to double down and tell me that Taylor Decker is our left tackle. Penay Sul is our right tackle. Are you kidding me? Like, this is, this is why the Lions have sucked for 60 years, and it's why they'll suck maybe for another 60 years until they get their head out of their butts, honestly. This is ridiculous. You don't draft a generational-type left tackle, move him to the right, see him fail at the right, then you move him back to the left because of injury circumstances, see him succeed on the left, and then you're going to push him back to the right when the guy comes back? Make the veteran move. Make the veteran move. He's, he's played right tackle in college. Yes, Taylor Decker's a top six, top eight left tackle. That's great. I could care less. My interest is in the rookie who I have committed to for the next five years. That if he pans out the way I expect him to, I may have the second or third best left tackle in the NFL in two, three years. And I'm going to sacrifice that. Because I don't want to hurt Taylor Decker's feelings, or I don't want to move him to the right, or I don't want to trade him. Get out of here. Get out of here. This is, this is the stupidity that has cost the Detroit Lions any and every opportunity to win anything significant in the last six years. It's just that simple. Brad Holmes, if you believe in him as a talent evaluator, you should be very happy that I'm saying, hey, you can get a first or a second round pick for Taylor Decker if he's not willing to stay on the right side for the next three years. All right, cool. I trust your, your answer should be, okay, I trust Brad Holmes to draft a right tackle in the first, second, third, maybe in a fourth round. Find somebody late that is, you know, solid, at least good. You can find that. There's, nobody's taking tackles in the top five, top ten every single year just to fix their offensive line. Like, it's a, it's a luxury pick, but it's also a necessity. So, Hank, Hank Fraley comes out and says, we're committed to Taylor on the left, and we're committed to Penny on the right. Can I just ask why? I just don't get it. You saw him fail miserably, miserably in the preseason. Any hope that he would turn out good on the right, he basically eliminated in the first three preseason games he played against. But no, no, Adam, no. We're going to play him at left tackle now for the next six to eight weeks. And then when Taylor Decker comes back midseason, and Penesul has now got six, eight starts under his belt at left tackle. We are suddenly going to move him to the right side. Yep. Sounds like the Detroit Lions to me. This is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. The team is nowhere near competing right now. They need a few years. Why, why by the time the Lions are going to be contenders, which I think they'll be a very good football team given the way the, the direction the front office is going. I'm actually happy with it. I may come off as I'm being very, uh, very mean right now, but I'm, I'm being just honest, guys. The team in three years should be competing for the NFC North. Taylor Decker's contract ends in three years. Why in God's name am I going to jeopardize the number seven overall pick at left tackle because I don't want to move Taylor Decker to the right side? Why? Why would I do that? Jeff Akuda looks like a bust right now. We're two years in. We've seen him play 10 games. Penay Sewell, good luck putting him out there for 10 games at right tackle. You're going to hate the kid by the end of the year. You're going to destroy his confidence, and he's not going to grow. His, the highest ceiling he can reach is on the left side. We can all agree on that. Penay Sewell's ceiling, the only way it'll ever be reached is by him playing left tackle. And if you want to move him to the right because you just want to act like you're smarter than everybody, go for it. But you're jeopardizing not only his future, but the team's future. This team is two years away from being able to compete. And you're telling me it's not worth developing the left tackle you drafted at number seven overall. It's not worth investing in him at the left, on the left side of the offensive line. What are we doing here, Jeff? You know what makes you know zero sense to me is is the fact that Penny Sewell went through training camp. All right, he he practiced at the right tackle position. They kind of he already was aware he was had to learn a new position. Comes into the preseason, plays right tackle for those for those three games or so, struggles, uh, and then comes into the regular season game as the youngest left tackle to ever start, 
and he plays as well as he did. So that's that's the biggest hint to, to the front office, to the team, to the coaching staff. This guy is a natural left tackle. And we're not saying he can't be a good right tackle. That's not what I'm saying. I think he can be a serviceable right tackle. But why why would you want serviceable at the seventh overall pick? You, you want the most out of your player. And your player, you're going to get the most out of him at the left side. People, Rock. Look, Rock Howard, we disagree a lot. And, like, I don't, I don't want to always have to disagree with you. But come on, man. Sewell is a good enough... Uh, Sewell is good enough to be a good right tackle with time. Bro, with time, Taylor Decker's going to need a new contract. And with time, two, three years down the line, where Penny Sewell's probably a good right tackle, what do you prefer? The next 10 years of shoring up your left tackle spot and your blind spot for your quarterback? Or, oh no, it's you know Taylor Decker, he can, he can stay on the left, Adam, and, and everything's going to be okay because we're going to move Penny Sewell to the right. Come on. Come on. You drafted a left tackle number seven overall. It's a good problem to have. You have two left tackles that are very good. One more raw, obviously. We only saw one game out of him. But the one game we saw out of him at left tackle, he performed 100x how he performed in the preseason against inferior opponents on the right side of the ball. Come on. This is not hard. And maybe, 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 there's always the possibility behind the, behind the building, inside the, inside the war room, inside whatever you know, room they're meeting in, I'm sure it could be that they're actually agreeing and saying, all right, Taylor's probably going to move to the right. We're not going to jeopardize this kid's future. I don't know. Maybe they're just coming out to say it, just to say it. But I don't like it. I don't like it. I don't think it's the right move. You have Decker for the next, what, three, three to four years. It's going to be 32. Ideally, you want Sewell for the next 12 to 14. Yeah. You're going to start the first, what, quarter of his career on the right side, then expect him to move back to the left side? This is just stupidity. It's just stupidity. Especially if Penny Sewell's become what, what Taylor's become in just pretty much one game. I mean, the guy played well. And Taylor's been in the league, what, five years? Taylor Decker. And he's just coming around at 28. Taylor Decker's a very good left tackle. He's one of the game's top six. That's a good thing. He's also a veteran. And he can move to the right. Or now, get, for any reason, I'm, I'm telling you guys, if I'm Brad Holmes and I'm sitting there right now, and come week six, somebody, somebody goes down on a contending team and they're like, Brad, I'm going to give you a first round pick and a fifth. Or Brad, I'm going to give you a second and a fourth or a second and a third. I'm probably not going to consider the second. I, I do want a first, but you know what? If Taylor Decker's not willing to go to the right and I'm being offered something I can't pass up on, I'm trading him. I'm not saying you have to trade Taylor Decker. You can move him to the right. I'd be more than happy with but if that. But I don't know if he's willing. If he's not... Well, then he's got to go gotta, because I invested the yeah. number seven overall pick on a left tackle for Penay Sewell to play <gasps> left freaking tackle. Go play Jeff Okuda at O-line right now if you want to play this game with me. <laughs> Why don't you just start him at safety? Put him out there with a torn Achilles. Who knows? See how he plays. What are we doing? Uh, we gotta I don't address, like this we, at all. We, before we go to the next topic, we got to address Jeremy. He said, there's a reason Sewell fell to us in the draft. If he was that good, he would have went sooner. Wow, yeah. You know what? I saw enough for me in the first... You know what? Actually, this is, I'm, I'm so glad somebody brought this up. Yeah, he did fall. Uh, let me tell you, explain why he fell. I don't, maybe you don't understand how football works, right? So number one overall, obviously, was Trevor Lawrence. Number two, the Jets needed a quarterback. They took a quarterback. Number three, San Francisco. They traded up to get a quarterback. quarterback. They went and got their quarterback. Mm -hmm. Number four, Kyle Pitch. Tight end. Generational type tight end. Cool. Number five, Cincinnati. Need a wide what receiver. do we need to give Joe Burrow? Me, personally, I would have drafted Sewell. I want to protect my franchise quarterback. But they went with Jamar Chase. It kind of worked out week one. J Jalen Waddle, go six. Adam, why, why wouldn't Miami protect Tua? Why? Because they need to figure out if Tua's even a quarterback. So they're giving him the weapons he needs so they can evaluate him properly. That's why Sewell fell to you, ding ding. Ooh, it's He's I in had, a fish I had to quote I had to quote Fish because I didn't want to swear. So <laughs> we got to move on. But this Me is too. just unbelievable. You guys, unbelievable. Ugh, way to get Adam riled up on a Friday when it's supposed to be happy happy fun times but whatever when we come back we're talking college football so stick around for that but before we go we need to hear about our friends over at my bookie all right guys uh last night i asked you to bet on the over i asked you to bet on antonio gibson going over on the rushing yards and i let you down and i had washington <laughs> 
covering. I apologize for that. 2-1 and one last night, but we're not going to cry over it. It's winning season, and it's football season. Bet anywhere, anytime using the my bookie Sportsbook. Use code WORDWORK. Sign up using uh, code WORDWORK. You get 50% off. $100 gets you $50. $200 gets you 100 Guys, there's no better time of year to bet than football season. And speaking of betting... Later on in the show, Jeff and I will be giving our best bets for the weekend. So excited to share that with you. We'll see you after the break. Tony is a third generation logger that has a simple, practical approach to life and work. That's why his Coast DX342 knife is perfect for him. The stainless steel blade is rust resistant and made for all weather use. And the double roll lock safety ensures that it will never inadvertently close when he doesn't want it to. That's why Coast is trusted tough. Welcome back, everybody. You're tuning in to The Morning Wood on the Woodward Sports Network. Happy to have you here. It's beautiful. It's Friday. Adam loves Fridays. <laughs> so the AP poll had the U at number 24 this week. MSU was outside of the top 25, but... I'm wearing my state sweater because I think state is still going to take this dub. I don't care about the AP poll. They're wrong. The U has done absolutely nothing to impress me so far this year. State is 2-0. and Obviously, the Youngstown State Penguins, meh, whatever. But I was not expecting them to beat Northwestern, and they did. So I think they can beat the U, too. And I'm, I'm pretty bought into Mel Tucker right about now. So... We'll see what these guys have to say. But so Michigan State is plus six versus Miami, and the over under is 56.5. Adam, my betting guy, what do you think about this? This is a tough game. This is a tough game to call. Um, if I'm a betting man, which I am, I'm probably taking State in the points, or I'm taking State on the money line. State looks the, the more comfortable, the more put together team right now. Miami yep. came out, they scheduled Alabama. That was, that's your fault. <laughs> So, okay, week two, they did okay. Uh, okay. App State. Yeah. Whatever. Whatever. Like, I'm not looking too much into it. It's going to be a close game, I think. I don't think either team blows the other out. I, I think Miami still offers a lot of problems to Michigan State. It's I'm very undecided. I think the game I think the game's definitely a close one. We'll see what uh, De'Ara King offers for Miami. I think that's going to be a big problem for State. It's a quarterback State hasn't really had to deal with this year yet. And we saw them last year against Indiana, against uh, mm-hmm. even uh, even Northwestern to an extent, the inability to keep the pocket contained and prevent anybody from getting outside, whether it's the running back or the quarterback. So I'm, I'm curious to see the matchup. I think it's a big it's a big game for State. This game really defines progress for Mel Tucker. If they lose it, it's fine. You, you're no panic mode. They're still in the rebuild. But if Mel Tucker is able to win this football game, he's essentially sent a message. All right, you guys thought we were going to win five, six games. I already got three of them done in the first three. Watch out. I'm coming. I need I need one more one more recruiting class, maybe two, but we're coming. And I love, I love what Mel Tucker is doing. I think he's doing a very good job in revitalizing the program. They've got some players there. They've got some players. The run game looked good again. Kenneth Walker didn't, you know, blow off against Youngtown State, maybe how most people expected. But you're, you're playing really to win the game, control the game. And I think Michigan State, more than Miami, has the ability to control the game. Now, what Miami offers that maybe Michigan State doesn't is, you know, how Michigan State hits you on the big plays, Miami is going to kill you with long, sustained drives. I think that's the clock control and who's, who's able to convert on third down is really going to determine who's going to win this game. So for me, if I'm taking uh, my pick, I, I got to say I'm, I'm confident in Mel Tucker and State to cover, and I'm also confident in Mel Tucker and State to win on the money line. I like both bets. The over-under is, is a tough one for me to call. I'm not, I'm not sure yet. All we've seen out of Miami is, is so far the loss to Alabama, which, yes, they scheduled the game. They, they took that L. But the next game, App State barely squeezing out 25-23. Uh, the only positive thing about um, this Miami football team is, is definitely Derek King. He hasn't been playing so well, but even to go back to last year, his years at Houston, um, he's always been a pretty good quarterback, especially on his feet as well. So I think that's going to cause some problems for Michigan State, uh, definitely. But like you said, it, it's their first not big test, but it's a test. I mean, they're a respectable football team. I like Michigan State's chances. Uh, MSU fans have to absolutely love what Mel Tucker's building. 
um, in the results he's putting out with the team that many people, including me and Adam, you know, think he needs a class or two to really get contending in the Big Ten. But uh, I like what I've seen out of this run game. We know Kenneth Walker didn't explode like he did game one, but him and George Simmons are a good one-two punch. Um, I, I would say a Hassan Haskins and Blake Corum are a better one-two punch, but this is a great one-two punch for this team. And um, I like what I've seen out of the run game. I like Peyton Thorne. So far, so far in terms of interceptions, he's flawless. Five touchdowns, zero picks. Um, he's playing solid. Uh, this is going to be, uh, what is this? Is it at Miami or is it at Michigan yep. State? Okay, it's so Miami. like I said, it's going to be a big test for this team, and I think it's a great staple, like we all predict. could be possible 5-0. and um, But this is the, the first uh, statement of that 5-0. and I mean, if they can win against Miami, I think they, they'll go into um, – you know, Nebraska next week undefeated. And I think it's going to be an exciting game regardless. I, I think, like you said, Derrick King can put on lawn, sustained drives with, with his legs um, and, and pr- trying to keep Peyton Thorne in that offense off the field. But it really comes down to this Michigan State defense. Can you get after Derrick King, make him uncomfortable, um, you know, get him out the pocket because he can move on his legs, even man. Even then, even if you do, that's the problem. So this game is so interesting. I, I like State on the money line because they're, they're plus, what, 206, 205? Yes. Like in a, when you're betting, you're not betting on feelings, guys. You're betting numbers. I'm taking state. If they were plus 140, 150, eh, I don't know how I feel about that. But you're getting good value in betting on state. And now you turn your attention to Miami. Miami is just going to convert third and um, third and median, you yeah. know, third and longs that you just don't expect them to convert. They are home. It's a big game for them. They don't want to fall uh, for a second time this year. <laughs> I, I, I see both teams walking away in a close game. That's why I'm taking State on the points. That's my confident bet. I think Miami wins maybe, if I, if I had to put money on it and predict a score, I'd say 27-23, 27-24. It's just going to be a close game. I don't see it getting away. The The team is, the young guys are starting to buy into Mel Tucker. I think the fans are to, uh, starting to buy into Mel Tucker. There's a lot of good vibes heading around Michigan State right now, and it's it's really deservedly so. The program's heading in a good direction, and um, it's it's a good thing for the Big Ten. It's an even better thing for Michigan and really the Ohio State's, all the teams. It's really a good thing to have a good Michigan team, a good Michigan State team, a good Wisconsin, a good Ohio State, even though they've been great for the last, what, 20 years. But still, you get my point. So that's what I'm looking forward to. Jeff, who do you got winning the game? Uh, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say MSU goes 3-0. and um, I, I think they win it close, 23-20. Um, I wouldn't be surprised. 27-20, uh, one score or less. So I, I think it's going to be a great game. But listen, man, I got State coming out with a win. I don't know. I think Peyton Thorne will keep it up unless he just completely craps the bed and De'Ara King just tears this defense up. But no, I, I'm confident in State, Mel Tucker. All right, what does State have to, three things State has to do to win? Um, Key things. Uh, the, that defensive front needs to be on point. Um, completely shut down the run game for, for Miami because they love to run the football. And I think the other thing is just – running the football for, for Michigan State and not making Peyton Thorne win you the game with his arm. I think if they get Kenneth Walker going, Jordan Simmons, it's only going to uh, it's gonna elongate these drives, keep Derrick King off the field, and it's going to increase their chances to win the football game. Uh, I, I have confidence, at least what I've seen from this Michigan State offense so far, they look great. I mean, they, don't, they haven't looked like they missed a step, and it's, it's due to the fact to those two guys in the backfield. So if they can run the ball successfully um, and stop the ball successfully, because you're not a good defense if you can't stop the run. I mean, that's 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 rule number one. So um, I think it'll limit Miami, and uh, it ain't going to be an app state. Uh, they ain't going to squeeze out close with a W. I think Michigan holds them off. And, um, yeah, I'm confident in state. Mel Tucker going up 3-0, baby. I still got confidence this team can go undefeated through the first at least four or five games. I mean, they, I think they beat Miami. You like that? Yeah, and it the more you sense. said it, I it did some research. Sense. I was like, you know what? He's not crazy. Yeah, he's not. He's not absolutely crazy. Not bad. <laughs> Kennedy, not bad. who do you think wins, state or Miami? I've got state. I'm ready. State for tomorrow. I like I said, Miami has not done anything to impress me thus far this year. I was very happy with state pulling out that win against Northwestern. I like Mel Tucker. I like what he's doing with the program. I've got state tomorrow, and I'm pretty confident in it. I would. Be surprised if the U pulls this out. I do not think they deserve to be in the top 25. Overrated. I'll Who, say State? It. No. Oh, Miami. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I Miami. They, well, they, that's the thing. When you start, when you start the regular season that ranked bad. number 14 and you lose to Alabama, right? No one's gonna kill you for no. it. <laughs> so no. they won their next game, and here they are. I mean, you know, maybe Miami's overrated. We don't know yet, but the State game is gonna tell us a lot about State and mm-hmm. Miami. So I'm excited to watch it. 
Yeah, I think State deserves to be in that top 25. But I, th I think they'll get in there after this week if they beat the U. So fingers crossed there. All right, well, we have to go to break. When we come back, we're going to talk about Michigan. For all you Michigan people out there that your ears are bleeding because we're talking about State, we've got you covered. Coming up next, but before we go, we've got to hear about our new friends at Guardian Alarm. Well, uh, listen, let me tell you about Guardian Alarm because uh, if we're talking about defenses and needing to stop Miami, um, I'll tell you about Guardian Alarm because Guardian Alarm gets it. A good defense on and off the field helps you feel secure. Guardian Alarm has the state-of-the-art technology that helps you feel safe, all with 24-7 local monitoring. Guardian Alarm also has convenient features that let you check in on your home, control lights and temperatures, detect smoke or carbon mon monoxide. It will even let you lock and unlock your doors. Call 800-STAY-OUT today. That's 800-STAY-OUT. Guardian Alarm has been trusted for over 90 years at keeping all families safe. Hi, I'm David Hall from Hall Financial. And at Hall Financial, we treat our clients like family. And our number one priority is giving each of our clients five-star service. Our passion for five-star service, combined with our expertise, allows us to find the best possible solution for refinancing your home loan. We take the time to focus on both the individual and the numbers. We're gonna walk you through the process and close your loan in half the time of our competition. Go to davidhallmortgage.com today. Welcome back, everyone. You're tuning in to the Morning Wood on the Woodward Sports Network. Happy to have you here. It's Friday. We've got lots of football. We've got high school today, college tomorrow, NFL the next day or Sunday. It's a lot. It's a lot to be grateful for. I love fall. It's the best. People are making way too many comments in the chat about my hair and beard. Why? This is why we do Lady Jane's live reads every day, guys. Oh, show they're wondering what, what happened to you? Yeah. Well, I mean, I did look like a caveman. I can't show, I can't come up here every <laughs> single day looking like a, a homeless person. So, True. you know, I did have to go, you know, get cleaned up. So I appreciate the compliments. Thank you, guys. Aww. When people are nice to Adam in the chat, this is rare. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we've got Northern Illinois versus Michigan tomorrow at noon as well. So I hope you guys have, like, split screens, multiple monitors so you can watch both games. Both of the games, Michigan State and Michigan, are at noon tomorrow. But for you betting people out there, U of M is the heavy favorite at minus 27 and a half. And the over-under is set at 54. So, Adam, my betting man, what are you thinking? I love this game on the over. Uh, Michigan has scored over 30 points in their first two games. People expected Michigan to take a step back week two against Washington, even though Washington, they were coming off a really bad loss. I don't think anybody was really out there putting their heads out and saying, all right, Michigan's going to score more than, more than 30. It's just unlikely. And all the sports books essentially kind of backed that theory up. They were giving you boosts over the weekend that if Michigan were able to score more than 28 points and win, that they would boost your odds on, on your bet. So Michigan has shown that they can be dynamic on offense. The way they run the football is just a pain. I'm not sure Northern Illinois has any chance this game. It's going to be tough for them to stop the run. Michigan, this is what they do. This is what they do under Jim Harbaugh. They just break you down, and they wear you out, especially the bad teams. Now, against the good teams, you go down early. It's very difficult to consistently run the ball the way they do, uh, or at least these past two weeks, like they've shown. So I think Michigan wins this game. I think they cover for sure. I'm taking the over. I think Michigan wins this game 45 45 to 7. Yeah. You know, not 45 7. I'd say 45, you know. 45-14. Give them two scores. Maybe even 52, 52-10, 52-14. Like, I, I see Michigan scoring over, over 35 easily. Whether or not Northern Illinois offers up anything on offense, we'll see. Michigan's pass, ru pass rush is absolutely phenomenal. I haven't seen Michigan have a pass rush like this since early Harbaugh, year one, year two, year three. Like, mm -hmm. this is the Michigan that you were putting in the top three, top five of the AP polls. This, this is the kind of brand football you, you want to play. And then whether or not Cade McNamara actually develops and gets better as the season goes on, we'll see. But again, we all saw what we saw from J.J. McCarthy. That's the future. That's the quarterback one next year. Now, whether or not he's going to take over this year, we'll have to wait and see. But I love, love me some J.J. McCarthy, and I'm excited to see what he does with the program moving forward. This really is... That, that next step we, we always discuss, and especially me, I sit up here and I, I, I try not to defend Harbaugh because he's lost so many big games, unable to win the bowl games, unable to beat his rivals. But, well, isn't that what Michigan's been the last 25 years, guys? And now we're here, and 
he may have the quarterback. And if he does going into next year or he figures it out this year, well, Michigan's going to be contending for the Big Ten. And that's going to turn a lot of heads. So, Jeff, what do you think about this game? I, I, I mean, your thoughts exactly. You made the point they, they're not going to be able to stop the run. I completely agree. I mean, if you look at Northern Illinois, the last two games they've played, they gave up almost 200 yards rushing completely. So um, it's, it's a recipe for disaster. I mean, you're going against a team in Michigan who, number one, Jim Harbaugh loves to run the ball down these unranked teams' throats. And it's a simple analogy of football. I just said it earlier. If you can't stop the run, you don't have a good defense. And they're not going to be able to stop these two. Blake Corum, um, it, it, Hassan Haskins, and even look who's behind center for the Nor- 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 Northern Illinois. It's Rocky Lombardi. I mean, three touchdowns, three picks. Come on, dude. Um, I don't. I don't. It's going to be a blowout. It, it, I mean, you could pick whatever score you want. I'd say about forty seventeen. You could be forty fourteen. Whatever the case may be. I think Blake Corum's going to have a big day, get in the end zone a couple times, and uh, Cade McNamara will just do what he does best, game manage, and uh, just just feed those guys in the backfield. But yeah, this defensive front's going to overwhelm Rocky. I mean, if when he gets pressure, he's bound to turn the ball over, and, and we've seen this Michigan team. Uh, capitalize on those turnovers. I, I just think it's absolutely going to be a, a blowout for this Michigan team, and it's that's just, it's not really much more explaining to do than that. I think they'll win by thirty plus, and and Jim Harbaugh goes in next week three and zero. But we got we got to see this. Can we agree on this? We got to see this defense actually face because um, I agree this Michigan defense looks good, but uh, want to see how they match up against better opponents. I don't know. I don't know when they get Wisconsin. I believe it's in a couple weeks or even Michigan State or an Ohio State, but I'm excited. I want to see how this team matches up cuz so far this front like you said Adam, um they look good and they're getting after the quarterback. I mean, yes, it's been against uh, your Washington or whatever the case may be, but um you can't deny it. I mean, they've been looking good. So, I think they'll get after Rocky. They're going to overwhelm him and uh I think Michigan wins dominantly and uh, just pounds the ball completely down their throat. <laughs> and uh that's how the outcome turns out to be, really. Man, honestly, what I, I like the questions going on and the conversations in the chat. You know, is this the year Michigan beats Ohio State? And before the season ever started, before Ohio State ever came out sluggish and then they lost their second game to Oregon, before Michigan came out and kind of showed you promise on the defensive front and their run game, you were like, well, you know, Michigan's going into the year unranked. And when you go into the season with lower expectations, you, you're really playing with house money. No one's expecting anything of you. And you look at an Ohio State, who I think by the time they play Michigan is probably going to have two losses. Well, if there was ever a year for Jim Harbaugh to finally beat Ohio State, it would be the year they walked into the season unranked. They shocked people. And if, they, if you're telling me they beat Ohio State and Michigan State this year, that means they're playing in a Big Ten championship game. So... I don't know. Let the season play out. I think they have a chance this year more so than they've had in the last few years. Mm-hmm. And and we'll take it from there. Uh, Jeff, are you taking Michigan in the points, and are you taking the over or under? Um, I, I like the over. Like you said, I, I think this can be an absolutely um, blowout in terms of in terms of for Michigan. I th- think they can run away with the score. And uh, I picked them. What was the over? You said it was 50- 54 and a half. Yeah, I'm gonna take the over. On I mean, that. I think Michigan's covering at least 40, 45. Yes. Points, so all you really need is you just got to give Northern Illinois two to score a touchdown and a field yeah. goal. Yeah, I think. Ah, man. Look, I, I still think Michigan is has a lot to prove. They have a lot to prove. I'm not sold yet. The passing game without Ronnie Bell is very concerning, especially once you start playing the good teams. Once you start falling behind early, I agree. how are you gonna react? You can fall behind early to Northern Illinois. And still run the ball 50 times and win the game by two, three, four, five scores. That's still a possibility. You can't do that against Penn State, Ohio State, even Michigan State. Can you? Maybe they can prove us wrong this year. But we've seen it for six years now. You can't fall behind early because if you lose your game plan and you're Jim Harbaugh and you don't have a dynamic quarterback that can bring you back, well, you're going to get blown out. Right. And that's why he's lost all those games. So we'll see. We can agree mutually. Cade's been playing well up, managing the games. Obviously, the run's been getting going. Cade's, Cade's, just, Cade's had it easy. He, yes. he hasn't had to make any big third down throws. Uh, we saw Cade week one against Western make big time throws downfield to Ronnie Bell, but mm-hmm. Ronnie Bell's not available anymore. So I think loss. that really I think that really kills maybe their chances of being a legitimate team this year. I think they're going to drop a few games uh, before they even get to Ohio State. I don't see them running the table in the Big Ten. I don't. They, they may lose to a, a state, which I think is a fireball offense. I think they probably lose to maybe a Penn State. I, I don't know enough about the team yet. And what really concerns me is, again, the passing game. I think if J.J. McCarthy starts, 
I, I think I can sit up here confidently and say Michigan probably wins the Big Ten this year. I think Michigan can hey. win the Big Ten this year. Just given, I don't think the gap between Ohio State is this much as it used to be in years past. I think it may be just like this, and the teams that are right below are your Penn States, your Michigan, your Michigan States, and I don't think it's far-fetched to say Ohio State walks into the last game of the year, and even if they win, they're not in the Big Ten title game. So we'll have to wait and see how the season plays out. It It's going to be an interesting year. This is going to be a... The Big Ten's got a lot riding on this weekend. You don't want Penn State to lose. You don't want Ohio State to draw back to bad games. You want Michigan to dominate. You want State to go on the road and beat Miami, uh, beat a Miami. Right. And it really adds like legitimacy to your conference. You, this is a big week for the Big Ten. This is a big week. You don't want to walk away and half your teams walk away with a, another loss. So we'll have to wait and see how the season plays out. I'll, I'll keep saying it. How the passing game develops throughout the year is very important. I think. They're better off with J.J. McCarthy going forward. But Cade McNamara, to be fair, hasn't given me... Hasn't lost the job. He hasn't lost the job. And, you know, you don't want him losing the job, though, against the Rutgers, against the Wisconsin, against the Nebraska. You don't want to have to lose that game to sit him. So I'll, I'll give Harbaugh the benefit of the doubt. We'll see what they do. I think when the time comes, they will put J.J. McCarthy in, whether it's this season or next year. We'll have to wait and see. But Kennedy... Do you see Michigan winning? I know you hate them and uh, oh, as a Notre this Dame. Oh, weekend do I see them winning? Yeah. Oh, yeah. They got they got this. Are they going to beat your Ohio State Buckeyes? No. And you're you're talking a lot of things about them that I don't like. Yeah, I'll well, I don't I don't it. like how how awful they've looked in the first two games of the year. I don't either. <laughs> and I love Trust what me. I love more is how right I was about Ohio State. Yeah, no, nothing makes me happier than walking in on the morning and knowing how right I was about a lot of things. Oh, but regardless, gosh. Kennedy get us. I'm not giving that to you. <laughs> All right, well, we're talking about a lot about ranked and unranked teams. Let me tell you about one team that's not overhyped, and that's Chippewa Valley, the number one high school team. Uh, we've got them against Macomb, Dakota this – oh, today. It's Friday. Hello. We've got them today. Every Friday we broadcast the best game in the Metro Detroit area on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. So don't forget, you can watch it tonight thanks to Woodward Sports and the prep. So, yeah, watch it tonight at 9 p.m. Do not forget. And then, obviously, we've got that 10K – halftime kick so if you head out to the game make sure you stop by the woodward sports tents talk to whoever's out there follow us on socials and get that chance to kick for 10k thanks to woodward sports all right so coming up next we're gonna talk about oh around the nfl we're gonna preview all the games that are happening sunday woohoo but before we go we need to hear about our friends over at coast well, listen, since 1919, uh, Coast has pursued only really one mission, and that's to make the working professional's job safer and life easier. Today, Coast Lights are a favorite amongst tradesmen and women, outdoor enthusiasts, do-it-yourselfers, first responders, and more. You visit CoastPortland.com and use code WSN20 for 20% off your purchase because they stand by their products and back them up with a lifetime warranty. Buying for your whole crew, sign up with our Coast crew to take advantage of special discounts, early access to new products, and more. Again, use code WSN20 for 20% off your purchase. Okay, you thirsty little spin goblins. I want you to pedal into the next dimension. Spin it! Spin! Spin! Uh-oh! Carmen's falling behind. Let's give her the hiss of shame. Spin! Spin! Spin till you bleed! Don't ride the bike of shame. Come to Planet Fitness and find your own lane with tons of equipment, free fitness training, and no hissing. Join today for just $10 a month. Welcome back, everybody. You're tuning into the Morning Wood on the Woodward Sports Network. Happy to have you here. It's Friday. We've got lots of football coming up, so we're going to keep talking football. All right, we've got the following games coming up. We've got the Cowboys versus the Chargers, the Titans versus the Seahawks, and the Chiefs versus the Ravens. You guys, what are you thinking about these games? Let's start with the Cowboys versus the Chargers, Adam. Oh, man, I love this game. This, for me, is the game of the week. Like, yeah. if there was one yep. game you told me I have to watch on Sunday, I can't watch any other game, it is the Los Angeles Chargers and the Dallas Cowboys. The storylines, the implications, everything surrounding this game is absolutely vital. The Cowboys cannot afford to fall to 0-2. You just can't. Granted, they haven't played a divisional game yet, but you can't fall to 0-2. It's just not a good start. You, you, you really need to win this game. And 
And we'll talk about the Cowboys and Chargers game later in the best bets. I, I do have one of these teams uh, as my favorite bet of the weekend. But regardless, Dak Prescott, offensive menace. You have C.D. Lamb, Amari Cooper, Michael Gallup, yes, on IR, makes it maybe a little easier. But still, you, you're you going to have a tough time stopping this team. Although I think the Chargers have maybe a top 12 defense in the NFL, I'm not sure they're going to be able to slow down Dak Prescott and this dynamic offense. Mm-mm. Regarding the Chargers, though, they're no pushover. They do have a good defense. I think they have a better defense than Dallas. They have Justin Herbert, in my opinion, just slightly below Dak Prescott as a quarterback. But that's not... He's not too far off. He's only in year two. He's, he's shown so much promise. You have a Keenan Allen, a Mike Williams, and Austin Eckler. Hopefully, if he can stay healthy this whole season, that's going to be a problem. I really like what's going on in Los Angeles. For me, they're the fifth best team in football. This is a very tricky game. I, I think Dallas, Dallas is in trouble here. Dallas is in trouble. They're three and a half point underdogs. I really like the Chargers here, but before I give my pick away, Jeff, your thoughts on the game? Um, I think it's uh, two quarterbacks having a really great start to both of their their years throwing the football. Uh, We have Demarcus Lawrence out. uh, Derwin James is out. Lyle Collins is out. So obviously more so on the Dallas side. Michael Gallup obviously on IR. Um, and this Dallas defense is already already atrocious. So no Demarcus Lawrence, less of a pass rush. I think Joey Bosa is going to have a big day, but uh, it's really Ezekiel Elliott because he he didn't show us uh, Jack in that first game. And I know uh, Kellen Kellen Moore went away from running the football, but they got to get back to it. They got to get Zeke uh, some touches. I know Dak could throw fifty plus attempts again, uh, considering the year he's he's on track to have. But um, Dak's really been the Dak. You know, we saw last year before the injury. You know, when he led the league in yards for for a majority of the year before guys even caught up to him. So uh, it, it's a tough game. It's it's in LA. It, 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 I, who do you think is going to win? You got the Chargers winning. Oh man, so I'm still struggling with this. I got Dallas winning. I was I got okay. Dallas I'm actually winning surprised. And, and we'll preview uh, how I have them winning uh, in our best bets. But Dallas can't afford to lose this game. You know, L- I, look, there are two teams this weekend that cannot afford to lose. Like, literally, they cannot afford it. And the momentum. It would be disastrous. For momentum, for confidence, for morale, the whole shebang. Cleveland cannot lose to Houston. And I think that's going to be a closer game than people think. And Dallas cannot go away and lose to Los Angeles. They just can't afford it. I think Los Angeles is the better team. But you're talking narrative, storyline? Dallas cannot fall to 0-2. I don't think they can recover from it. The NFC... The N- NFC East probably is a 9-10 win division this year again. But you don't... You know, maybe... I may be looking too much into this, but I really believe and I really believe that Dallas... The implications of them falling to 0-2, they're, they're just a team that is overanalyzed and overcovered because of their brand. And to fall 0-2 would bring way too much attention to this football team. I think they need to win this game. I think... The Chargers are still a little early. They're still a little raw. I think they're the better team. But from what I saw from Dallas week one against Tom Brady, the defending champions, uh, Tampa Bay Buccaneers, it's, I like Dallas, especially at an underdog price. Who do you got? I, I, I had Dallas. I thought you were going to roast me. When oh, I, when no, I, but listen, no, no. This, is, this is why I have Dallas. I think, number one, their offense, the Chargers, yes, Justin Herbert can, can score touchdowns, and their defense is going to excel, but they're not going to be able to stop Dak. So if they're going to want to beat this Dallas team, they're going to have to keep it high scoring. I mean, Dallas is not afraid to, to, to run up the score, and uh, I think the momentum that Dallas is carrying from last Thursday – Almost beating the Super Bowl champions with their defense that played at two turnovers on Tom Brady. Um, didn't play horrible. They gave up, what, 30 points. But at the end of the day, that's momentum they're bringing into this week versus the Chargers. So I have the Dallas Cowboys winning, and that was for that exact reason. I think they're coming off a loss, and they can't afford to go 0-2. Um, Jerry Jones will will be upset. He'll be very upset. And um, Dak Prescott, I, I think Justin Herbert, they're going to lose this game, but I think the Chargers bounce back. I, I, th- I predict them. I'm, they're a top-10 team in the NFL to me. Um, they're in that they're in that list, top five to Adam, but nonetheless, they're they're a great team above Dallas for that matter. And I think they'll have a better season overall than Dallas. But this game, man, it's a big game, and I think Dallas going to LA and, and getting a win is big. So I, I got Dallas coming out with a win. I think they can't afford to go two. I agree, I agree with you completely. I had it in my notes. They can't afford to go oh two. It, it's it's too uh, steep of a mountain to climb, and I have them winning the NFC East. So to do so, gotta start winning games. So it's, it's one of those games where you just look at it and you're like, all right. Everything in my mind tells me Los Angeles. Right. 
They've got this. They proved it against Washington. Now they've got Dallas, and they're trying to assert themselves. Okay, well, well then something just tells me, well, Dallas can't really afford to lose this game. I, I don't see it. Uh, we'll have to wait and see, but we can move forward with the Titans and the Seahawks. Jeff? This one's another tough one. One of my favorite games of the weekend, personally, because I want to see how the Titans bounce back from that horrendous, horrendous loss versus the uh, Arizona Cardinals. And, and Chandler Jones had a field day. The Seahawks aren't going to bring that same defensive pressure. Um, so they don't have, they don't have the uh, you know, defensive linemen like the Cardinals do, but it's still going to be an interesting game. you got Russell Wilson versus Ryan Tannehill in this stacked offense. Uh, I think Seattle ends up winning this. I like Russell Wilson too much. I, I think he's going to just find a way to win the game. But you can't cut out Tennessee. I don't think they're going to show the same football they showed week one. They're going to come out, and Derrick Henry, I mean, he played awful. Julio Jones played awful. A.J. Brown played awful. It was a very um, collective, awful uh, football game for them. So I think they bounce back, but I still have Seattle coming out with a win. Uh, I think the knock in the pass for the, the knock in the pass with the Seahawks the last two or so years is this defense and how you know too much of a load Russell Wilson has been really is put on his shoulders. I think they played well game one versus the Colts. We'll see how that carries on to game two versus the Titans, and this is the real test right here at home. I, I predict they come out with a W. I got the Seahawks winning. Okay, good. So we agree on the winner at least. See, uh, Seattle. Yeah. I, I think Tennessee's just they're falling off. Yeah, they're going to be one of the teams that made the playoffs last year that isn't going to make it this year. Yes, they acquired Julio and they they made you know marquee signings, but Ryan Tannehill's limited. When your defense isn't as dominant as it was last year, and you show up against Arizona and they basically drop thirty eight on you, and it was ugly the whole time. Well. You can't play from behind. You can't afford to play from behind. And how you beat teams last year was you got ahead early. You ran the ball with Derrick Henry, ran play action. You, got, you, you hit A.J. Brown deep. That was your game plan all of last season. Well, this year you have a more difficult schedule, and you're going to be playing better teams, and you're going to fall behind early. So I, I don't I – don't, man, I don't like Seattle – not Seattle. I don't like Tennessee at all this year. I don't like them in this game. Seattle, again – September Russell Wilson is essentially on the level of like Patrick Mahomes, mm -hmm. you know, Tom Brady, the guys who are just so good in September. It's it's going to be tough to beat Seattle. I've got Seattle winning. Uh, I've got them covering as well. It's a good game. And then we'll move on to the last game. Oh, well, actually, we got two more games, Jeff. But let's start with uh, Packers and the – actually, I'm sorry. Ooh, I jumped one. Chiefs, Ravens. So with the Chiefs and Ravens, listen, the Ravens have been hit with the injury bug. All right, and it's depressing for Ravens fans, I'm assuming. I mean, you got Marcus Peters, J.K. Dobbins, Justice Hill, Ronnie Stanley, Gus Edwards, Nick, Bol uh, Nick Boyle. I can keep going. I mean, I don't know what's going on in Baltimore, what they're feeding them down there, or, or what they got on the turf field, but these guys are getting injured. And I think the Chiefs win this one convincingly. It may not even be close. I, I just think the Ravens' defense has been shaky as of late, especially game one against the Las Vegas Raiders. Gave up, what, 400 yards to, to uh, Derek Carr. But, I mean, it, yes, they stopped the run, but you don't need to stop the run against the Chiefs. Eric, Patrick Mahomes is going to air it out. And, and they might either it's coming back on them or just blowing them out in general. I think, um, you know, losing Marcus Peters is going to hurt them significantly, especially in the secondary where they're known. To be to be good in the secondary, I think Marlon Humphrey's already banged up. He's he's uh he's I think he'll play, but we don't know if he'll play injured. So I got the Chiefs winning comfortably. This is a Sunday night football game. This is going to be a great game to watch. I've got this is a tough game to call, man. I've got Kansas City winning. I think Baltimore again is one of those teams that they're going to fall off the map. They they made it to the playoffs last year. I think the running the injuries at running back are just so hard to overcome for Lamar Jackson. He's not a drop back 30, 35 times a game quarterback. And when you're not able to do that, you really have to settle for first and second down runs that maybe don't set you up in a position ideally that you want to be in. And Tyson Williams, a good debut, but all right, now I got 30, 40 plays of Lamar Jackson and Tyson Williams. How am I going to seal the edge? How am I going to prevent Lamar Jackson from escaping? Kansas City, I don't think they win ugly. But I think this could easily turn into a, a blowout game for Kansas City. I don't see how, how Baltimore, without a Marcus Peters, is supposed to stop Tyreek Hill, let alone Travis Kelsey. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't include a Michael Hardman running down, what, 30, 40 yards downfield every three, four, five plays. Like, they're going to be testing Baltimore deep, and I feel like they're going to hit him a few times. It's, it's inevitable, in my opinion. Let's move on to the Los Angeles Rams and the Indianapolis Colts. Colts got hammered yeah. by the Seattle Seahawks. They had no chance. They had no chance. I love this game. Matthew Stafford, highest career passer rating ever in his debut for the Los Angeles Rams. Granted, it was against the Bears, but still, 
the Rams looked really good. Mm-hmm. Now they're going away to Indianapolis. Indianapolis, again, one of those teams you look at, you're like, well, you can't afford to go, fall 0-2. Well, yeah, you kind of have to. Sorry. The Rams are just a much better team than you. Better defensive front. Cooper Cup back healthy. That's just a recipe for disaster for Indianapolis. I don't see how they get anywhere near close to this game. They lost by 17 to Seattle. I expect them to lose by a similar margin against Los Angeles. For me, Los Angeles wins this game comfortably. I have them covering as well. I believe they're only three and a half point favorites. So, for really, that, what that tells me is Vegas has them as a touchdown favorite at six and a half, but they gave the home team three points, so it went down to three and a half. I am taking that bet. Matthew Stafford and the Rams to dominate and beat the Colts. Jeff, what say you? Uh, I agree. I'm not sure if it'll be a domination or not, but I got the Rams winning regardless. I mean, yes, this Colts defense is, is a good defense. You had DeForest Buckner, Darius Leonard, Kenny Moore. I mean, they're respectable defense, but Matthew Stafford on the other side of the ball has two of the best defensive players in that game. So, uh, listen, I think the Rams win comfortably. I think Aaron Donald is going to be a problem for Carson Wentz. Yeah, they got a good offensive line, but it does not matter whether it's in the secondary with Jalen Ramsey or up front with uh, Aaron Donald. I think they're going to give Carson Wentz problems and uh, maybe even stop Jonathan Taylor early on. So I got the Rams winning. Uh, Matthew will have a good game, even regardless if it's against this pretty good talented defense. I think he'll, uh, he'll succeed. Like you said, Cooper Cup, Robert Woods, he loves airing it out, and, and Sean McVay is going to make – just make it too crafty for this man to not throw dumb turnovers. Like, he's going to be fine. Matthew's going to probably throw for another 300 yards, couple tubbies, and uh, get a win. Tubbies, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> and then come home with a win. So, you know All right, last game. Last game before we head into the break. Miami versus Buffalo. Buffalo is away to Miami. Now, this is a game, when we talk about implications, this probably has the most season-long implications. Again, it's only week two. No need to yep. overreact. But if you're Buffalo... Not only do you fall to 0-2 if you mm-hmm. lose to Miami, but they already have the head-to-head advantage on you until you play them again later on in the year at home. So if Buffalo can go away and beat Miami, it is a statement win. And it really sets them up to win the division comfortably for the rest of the year. Now, if Miami wins, well, now you're two games back and you're already a game back in the division. That, that really makes the division interesting. Jeff... What are, you, what are you looking forward to this game, and who do you think is going to win? It's the perfect example you just brought up of you, you can't afford to go down 0-2, and that's the perfectly summed up right there. This team, the Buffalo Bills, many who you know, I have picked Josh Allen to be my MVP this year, he, he still has a chance to do that, but if you fall down 0-2, it's hard to make a case for you. So it, it, Miami Dolphins, they're 1-0. They feel good. Um, if they come out and beat Buffalo, the Buffalo Bills, go up 2-0, beat two teams in their own division they're looking good and two is getting comfortably so uh, i think josh allen bounces back regardless if it's in miami i think josh has a big game here and wants to really take control of this division early on because uh, i still have the buffalo bills winning this division we'll get to that topic later in the show but um i, I just think it's yes the dolphins are one and oh but it is what it is i think week two, week two or three they'll be one and one so i got the buffalo bills winning all right, I like it. Uh, I got the Bills winning as well. Again, a bounce back game for Josh Allen. The offense looks stifled. One of the better third down quarterbacks. He didn't play all that well on third down against Steelers, but granted, the Steelers have a defensive front that I think Miami can't match. A secondary that Miami can't. Uh, maybe they can Miami, maybe match. Maybe similar in the secondary, but still, I think the Buffalo Bills score around 24, 27 points. Anything more than that, I think they win this game comfortably. Miami, we saw them against New England, only score 17 points. So we'll have to see how Tua develops, if they can move the ball downfield. Um, I have the Bills winning as well. To everybody in the chat saying that the Colts are somehow going to win 34-21, and they just lost 31-17 to the Seahawks, who, if you compare rosters... I would take the Rams roster over the Seahawks, but, you know, it's the NFL. Anything can happen, but... Their best receiver looked like Naheem Hines, so I, I don't know what the 34 points is coming yeah, from. Yeah, Michael Pittman Jr. was shut <laughs> down. <laughs> Zach Pascal was okay. Good luck. Whatever. Uh, we got to go to break. Kennedy, get us out of here. I was going to say, hey, man, go horse, but whatever. Um, NFL division power rankings coming up next, but before we can get to that, we got to know about that pizza over at Papa Romano's. All right, listen, let me tell you about these uh, Papa Romano's handcraft pizzas that have been made a Detroit favorite for over 50 years. House-made dough, hand-cut veggies, and fresh cheese make the difference. The same quality goes on to all their pizzas, salads, subs, and pitas. Order now at paparomanos.com. 
I'm looking to bring on another HVAC tech right now. We are recruiting five to 10 techs a month. We're looking to grow and expand. Every new tech we hire is from Northwestern Tech. The hands-on training is fantastic. They're always my first call. We love hiring Northwestern Tech grads. They come out trained and ready to work. Our program is only 10 and a half months and our next classes are starting soon. So why wait? I'm looking to hire. I'm looking to hire. Hire a graduate of Northwestern Tech. Northwestern Tech. Northwestern Tech. Northwestern Tech. Northwestern Tech. Welcome back, everybody. You're tuning in to Woodward Sports, featured on the Roar 93.5 FM, 99.1 FM, and 94.7 HD2. Happy to have you here with us on a Friday. We have made it to the end of the week. It is a great day. All right, so we love power rankings, so now we're doing it for the NFL divisions. I think one and eight are pretty obvious. Obviously, the undefeated NFC West and the 0-1 NFC North would be in eighth, I'm assuming, boys. Here we go. Um, but you guys let me know. We'll start with you, Jeff, or Adam. Jeff, Adam. And Jeff, Adam. Um, you start. I'll do the <laughs> What honors. are your divisional power honors. rankings? Let right, me know. Do we want to start at one or do we want to start at eight with the worst? How do you guys want to do this? Let's we'll start, start, we'll start, with start with the worst. worst. Start with the worst, That's right? What you're All right, to the worst division in football right now is the AFC South. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, it's not it's not the NFC North. It's the AFC South. Um, in my opinion, I think the NFC North teams, you had the Packers play a New Orleans team that looked really good. The Vikings lost to the Bengals. They're an AFC North team that, you know, looks nice. Uh, Chicago, they lost to one of the best teams in football. And Detroit, of course, lost to the Niners. Look, I think the AFC South is eighth, and then I have the NFC North seventh. I have the NFC North 7th, the Detroit Lions, awful, the Bears, awful, the Vikings, decent, and the Packers, they'll be fine. We're not going to overreact to one game, and if we are, that's fine, but I'll bet my money on the Packers to recover. Uh, Jeff, who's your 8? It's it's definitely the, um, you got the NFC North as your 8th? Yep. No, no, AFC South as my 8th, and then the NFC North as my 7th. I'll go NFC East as my eighth. Really? The horror of the worst? Oh, Absolutely. I don't think so at all. Um, listen, uh, you could you could probably argue the AFC South too, honestly. Like the Titans and Colts look awful, but um, uh, I don't like the Giants. The, the Washington has a good defense. Um, the Eagles, they're 1-0, and they're the, they're the leader of the division. So um, I don't know. Uh, what would you say, AFC South? I've got AFC South. Here, you want me to run through my, uh, yeah, my at least 8-4? to four? Yeah, or eight it, to run five. through a Let couple run of eight them. To five. Yeah. Okay. Eight, AFC South. Okay. Seven, NFC North. Six, NFC East. Five, this is where it gets a little challenging, right? I've got the AFC East. I don't think... The AFC East is loaded with, you know... I think they're all, like, really equal on roster, but that doesn't mean they're the, one of the better divisions. I don't think they're a top-four division in football. Mm -hmm. uh, so those are my eight to five. You... Now, are we like off a little bit? Do you have them higher? So lower? this is. I, I, listen, let me just let me just name mine. Uh, listen, I, I like the AFC South as the worst division. Honestly, like I guess you, I, I give you that because they got more worst teams in, in rebuild mode. I mean, the Jag, the Jaguars and the Texans are absolutely awful. So I mean, they're one and zero the Texans, but on paper they're they're not ready to contend this year. So I'm not, I don't have a problem with you putting the AFC South uh, eighth. My my seventh, I'd probably put the NFC East um, over the uh, NFC North just because. I, listen, the Packers, I believe, are, are you could say the Cowboys are all that. Obviously, they're overrated by the media, but on offense, yeah, they're they're pretty good. But the Packers last year were pretty good on offense as well, and I think they're better defensively than the than the Cowboys, especially now after losing. They got no Demar uh, Demarcus Lawrence. I mean, they're already awful as it is. So I, I think AFC South, I, I, you could put NFC East and then NFC North. Uh, I think I'd put the NFC North right after the NFC East. Um, yeah, you got the Packers, the Vikings, Lions aren't that good. You kind of bring the division down a little bit, but. Chicago's respectable. I mean, it's, I, I'd take Chicago over Philly. You know what I mean? Or, or, you know, Minnesota over Philly. Like, that's the second team in the division about to I don't know. This Philly looked good, but... But you, you're the one who said Jalen will be out the league in a couple years. You did say that. Yeah, yeah, but they look good week one. <laughs> yeah, they did. Well, look, I, I still th I'm still going to stand by. It was one good game. You're right. If Jalen Hurts puts together three, four, five, six consistent weeks of football, and he can make mistakes, it's fine. He's a young quarterback. But if he consistently shows me that he can stay dynamic, he can per avoid getting... Uh, taking the big hits. If he can make the throws downfield like he did make we week one, uh, I'll absolutely, I would love to be wrong about Jalen Hurts. I don't want all these right. people to, to just fail, just just so I can be right. No. Rooting for Jalen Hurts, but I don't think 
given his organizational support, he's going to succeed in the league. I think that Philadelphia Eagles are probably the worst organization in football right now. Pretty, pretty close to the Lions. So we'll have to wait and see. I don't like what they did with Carson Wentz. I don't like what they did with their head coach. So we'll have to, we'll see how it plays out. But you know, good for, good for Wentz, not Wentz. Uh, good for Jalen Hurts, Week One. Who do you have at five? Who is it again? Five. I had the AFC East. Okay. So I'll give you my four to one. Yeah, give me your right? four to one, and I'll go. So, man. Th- okay, so my a- the AFC East the AFC East is fifth. Although, like again, Buffalo is my Super Bowl pick this year, but. I just the Jets aren't all that great. I think we're overvaluing New England, yep. and I think Miami is where I kind of feel like they are. So maybe I should put them at four. I'm I'm not gonna argue. My one is gonna be the NFC West. My two yeah. is gonna be the AFC West. Mm-hmm. My three is gonna be the AFC North. Yep. And then we mutually agree there. So okay. So then your four, we're gonna have the same four then. Yeah. We, okay. have, we pretty much have it was just all our towards back end of the list that we really okay. disagree well, on. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't, I'm not comfortable putting the NFC North dead last. I'm just not. I can <laughs> rip on the Bears and Lions all I want, but you have to take into consideration the Vikings are going to give teams problems this year. Yeah, the Packers are probably going to win the division. Not saying much, but they're gonna. They're a good football team. Back to back NFC championships. Like, let's not mm-hmm. overreact to one week. Relax, as Aaron Rodgers would say. Let's let's see how they play. If they bounce back against Detroit, I'm curious to see how that works out. But we'll go from there. Uh, Kennedy, I have a question for you, actually. Oh no. Okay. Do you do you think the NFC North is the worst division in football? Because I feel like people are overreacting to it. No, I mean, what did you see week one that you liked that much to not put them last? That would be my question back to you. Well. I like the Vikings roster, offense and defense. I think they're pretty balanced. I think Green Bay just got beat down to a, by, by a better team right now in the season. We saw Tampa Bay lose 38-3 to against New Orleans last year, and they won the Super Bowl. So it's one football game. You can lose football games. Yeah, but when, you're a, when you're a team that's expected to compete, you're going to lose football games. Now, if you're a team like the Lions, let's say, or the Bears, and no one's really expecting you to win anything significant, well, you're... You're not going to surprise anybody by losing, and you'll probably sneak in a few wins this year that maybe nobody expects. But, no, I, I don't think they're the worst division in football. I just don't. I think the AFC South is. I think based on what we see, what we've see, we seen thus far week one, which is all we have to go off of so far for this season, I think it's not an overreaction based on week one. But that's just my opinion. I think the Titans, too, surprise a lot of people. I mean, this is a team that was picked to be the top of the AFC South, and they completely – uh, crap the bed, and now they're they're going against a Seattle Seahawks who is a better team than you know um, at least with the quarterback. I believe Russell Wilson is going to be a tough challenge for for the Tennessee Titans at Seattle. I believe it is so um, they could go 0 and 2, and that's why the FC South like you got the Texans 1 and 0. I mean they got one more win than the NFC North, so it is what it is. And, and NFC North on, they, they haven't won a game, but it's still I believe the FC South is just too bad on paper. They got like three four teams that are going to be awful this year. I mean. All right. Fair enough. Uh, Kennedy, get us out of here. When we come back, I know we got to talk about who we think our division winners are, so I'm excited for that. Yeah, that'll be fun. We haven't had that discussion yet, so stick around for that, you guys. But before we go, we need to hear about Adam's favorite people, his friends over at BetQL. Yeah, BetQL, guys, you want an advantage over your sports book. You need to download BetQL today, the only app you'll need to make smart bets. Plus, their platform has all the data and analytics you would ever need for all of your own betting purposes. Guys, last night, BetQL for me was 4-1. and one. They, they told me to go over on Gibson's rushing yards. They told me not to take the cover, and I didn't listen. And I took Washington to cover, so I didn't listen there. So I lost that bet. They told me to take the over on the points. They told me to take the under on Galladay. I didn't listen. And they told me to take the over on McLaurin. I listened. Guys, they, they, went, they basically went 5-0. and oh. I just went 4-1. and one. I didn't listen enough, but whatever. It's all good. BetQL is the only app you need, guys. I use it. You mention or use code WSN, and you'll get an additional 25% off their subscription package. It's, guys, even if you're only betting $10 a day, that's $300 a month. You're telling me you're not willing to spend an additional dollar or two a month or a day, I should say, to ensure that you're making the best bets? That's that's kind of the way I approach it. I'm, I, I'm usually one that's skeptical on this stuff, but... I've really opened up to it, and I'm really enjoying using BetQL. So I would recommend it to everybody at home and all of my friends. So we'll see you after the break. Take care. 
Fellas, football season is here. It's time to make your grooming experience easy like Sunday morning. Get to Lady Jane's Haircuts for Men. Walk in, relax, watch your favorite team play, and before you know it, your hair will be game ready. Get to Lady Jane's, open 10 to 8, 7 days a week. Walk in anytime. It's wicked awesome. Make sure you download the Woodward Sports app in the App Store and the Google Play Store today. Take Woodward Sports with you wherever you go and listen live on your phone or mobile device. Welcome back, everyone. You're tuning in to the Morning Wood on the Woodward Sports Network. Happy to have you here. It's Friday. It's beautiful. There's football this weekend. It's great. Everything's great. We love it here. All right. So we just did these two's. NFL division power rankings, but now I want to know who are your division winners and why. Let's start with you, Jeff. All right, let's start in the AFC. All right, we'll go. Uh, I'll go AFC East. I got the Buffalo Bills. Uh, AFC North. I got. Oh, whoa, chill, chill, chill. Let's uh, go back. And forth. All right, just do AFC. <laughs> let's do AFC East. We'll do one all right, at a time. AFC East. I, I got the Bills as well. I think they're just the most talented roster in the division. They yes. have the best quarterback, and they have the oldest quarterback which is odd to say considering it's, he's like four years in yeah. i mean no not even three years out, four years I mean, whatever the case is yeah. it's a young it's a young quarterback division it's the youngest in nfl history i believe the bills will bounce back i think i don't think tua has it in him to win the division this year although he's eight and three as a starter uh, we'll see how the season plays out but for the afc east yeah i agree bills it, it's the clear one uh okay, we'll, AFC, we'll, north. afc north you can go you, tell me yours all right afc north i've got the Cleveland Browns winning the AFC North. I don't see, I don't, I don't see Pittsburgh holding on. I think Pittsburgh, like last year, they'll come out to a hot start. Everybody will overhype the Pittsburgh Steelers, but they didn't look any good on offense against uh, Buffalo. Mm-hmm. They didn't look good. That was a great catch by Deontay Johnson, and that was about it. They got no push from the offensive line. They weren't able to run the ball, and that was their down, downfall last year. So. I, I don't think the Steelers have it in them. I don't think the Ravens are going to be able to contend. The Ravens are probably a 6-7-8 win team this year yep. just because of the injuries that they've they've occurred going into the year. So we'll have to see how the season plays out. But for me, Cleveland, Jeff. And that's and that's with a loss, too, which is probably shocking to a lot of people. But I think they're going to bounce back quicker. And they got Houston Texans, a team that is going to make the process of bouncing back way easier for them. But I don't think the Pittsburgh Steelers win the division. I think even if they start one and zero, you know, four and one, five and zero, whatever the case may be, they're gonna they're gonna fall down the slope like last year. I think Cleveland arises, and I got confidence this football team on paper is the most stacked team in the FC North. So um, I got them winning again. I agree with you, the Ravens might not Cleveland clear. They're not gonna clear double digit wins, eight nine wins maybe. Um, but yeah, we'll move on to the FC South. All right, now I'll uh, I'll say my pick. I got the the Colts, and this was hard. All right, this very hard because I want to pick the Tennessee Titans, someone that I, I was high on the Titans all year in, in offseason just because I felt you're adding a Julio Jones into a dynamic offense already. But the, the key part is they lost their offensive coordinator. All new things, changes they're going through. It's going to take them some games to figure it out. I think before they do figure it out, it's already too late. I think Indianapolis Colts will have enough wins to win the division. I don't know how many wins that will, will, will be necessary, maybe 10 wins to win this division. But I think the Colts get it done. I think they win the division. All right, fair enough. I am on board with you. I think the Colts get it done. Even if they fall to 0-2, which I expect them to, they've lost two non-divisional games. So really, it's the team that goes four and two, five and one in their division in the AFC South is who's going to end up winning it. I don't think it's going to be the Tennessee Titans. I expect them to fall to zero and two. I expect the Houston Texans to lose. So here we are. The division leaders probably one and one going into week three. It's it's not that much to recover from. Again, I think it's the worst division in football. I have the Colts winning as well. We can move on to the AFC West. Yep. Jeff, who do you got winning? Honestly, do I have to say it? It's, no, Can- you do. it's Kansas City. Okay. All right. It, it, you know what? Yeah, and you know exactly why. You saw it in game one. Regardless of what the score is, Patrick Mahomes it, it, it finds a way to win. Andy Reid finds a way to win. Eric Bieniemy. Uh, These guys just have a process in a, in a culture in Kansas City, and it revolves around turning on the Jets when you're down. You saw it in the playoffs last year, what they're able to do on that run to get to the Super Bowl. But, my God, the, they got Ravens this week. They're going to be 2-0, and and I think they just arise from there. So I, I got the, the Kansas City winning. This division. All right. Um, I got the Los Angeles Chargers winning this division. <laughs> yep. I know. I know. I just, I'm in love. I am in love with this team. I think the Chiefs are going to struggle this year. They're going to struggle in the regular season. Now, that's not to say they're not going to ten- contend for an AFC championship appearance or whatever it may be. But I, I really have a good feeling about the Chargers defense. I think they're more explosive and dynamic than the Chiefs are. And on offense, really, it's Patrick Mahomes, Tyreek Hill, Travis Kelsey, you saw what they're able to do. They're going to be a tough team to beat. 
But I think the Chargers are a 12, 13 win team. So if the Chargers are winning 12 games, I, I think 12 games may be the number for the division. Now, who wins it on tiebreaker? Maybe both teams finish the year 12 and 5. I'm not sure. But I, I have a gut feeling about the Los Angeles Chargers, and I'm going to. I'm going to ride with it. I really think this can be the year the Chargers win it. I think they surprise a lot of people. And if they don't, I think it'll be based on tiebreaker. I think they'll win the same amount of games as Kansas City. That's not to say Kansas City's going to fall off a cliff. No, I still think they're probably the team to beat in the AFC. But I think division-wise, Chargers might, might be able to sneak out of it. Denver's not a pushover. The Raiders aren't a pushover, and neither are the Chargers. So Kansas City is going to have more work to do inside their own division than they're really going to have to do outside of it. And they play the AFC North. You got to think that that would be quite an accomplishment. First year head coach Brandon St- uh, Staley coming in, winning the AFC West like that. That is impressive, especially over a Kansas City team who, who many pick this revamping offensive line. Nobody's getting in the way of them. I I, I think. Listen, I think the Chargers are going to be good. I obviously got them in my top ten, but uh, I think they're they're second in this division. I think Kansas City gets. You know, around what thirteen wins, uh, possibly fourteen wins if they're if they're really good. Yeah, or if, if they win thirteen, fourteen games, it's their division. But I, I think Kansas City is a twelve win football team this year, and I think and even if I they think, are, I, I think the Chargers have a chance. I really do. Let's say they are a twelve win football team. I just don't. You know, in a world, I see the Chargers not clearing like twelve wins or if eleven wins. Like they're a great team. I just I think it's going to be closer than people think. I could and see, we'll again, revisit it. We'll Kansas revisit City it. can be everybody's favorites to win the division. That's fine. All I'm saying is I, I really think the Chargers have a chance. And for any reason the Chargers don't, don't be surprised if it's on tiebreaker or if Kansas City's 13 wins, LA's 12, or Kansas City's 12 wins, and the Chargers are 11. I think it's going to be really close. I really like the Chargers this year. Uh, we'll NFC go, East. Yep, Jeff. I'll go Cowboys. I'm still comfortable. They're 0-1. Oh, oh I think they tied up 1-1. One one. Um, I just thought, I think they have the most talent, uh, clearly, in this division. The Eagles start off 1-0. Oh and, uh, and oh. That's not going to uh, last the entire, entirety of the season. I think the, the Cowboys bounce back, and, and Dak, if he can stay healthy, Zeke can, can somewhat get on track. They'll get Lyle Collins back midway through the season season demarcus lawrence not sure if he's out the whole season but i got the cowboys winning by the end of the season i don't see the giants uh i don't see the washington football team listen they got a good defense but heineke you only can go as far as heineke can take you and we'll see over a 17 game schedule what heineke can do but as of right now i have trust in dak um not sure if i have trust in mike mccarthy but uh in, in, a, in a bad nfc east i got the cowboys winning the division um and i don't know how many wins that could be it could be listen if the cowboys can somehow get 10 wins. I think they win the division. I, I think Washington is going to be second, Eagles will be third, and then Giants will be fourth. I think it's sad to say, but the Giants are going to be looking for a quarterback. So I got the Cowboys winning. Uh, they've got the Chargers week two. I think they go one and one. And then down the stretch, they'll get um, guys like Michael Gallup back, and, and they'll start to get their team together. I just I think this offense is too dynamic not to win the division. Yeah, the, again, the offense is probably the biggest key in all of this. If they stay healthy, it's tough for me to pick against the Cowboys. I like what I saw to Washington last night. Heineke showed he can move the ball downfield. Terry McLaurin, probably one of the best receivers in the NFL right now. Mm-hmm. He's off to a great start to the year, but Dallas has got to be the pick. I do agree. Dallas is the team. I think they're a 10-11 win football team. 11 is going to be a stretch, but I think 10 is comfortable. I think a 10-7 and seven division winner in front of the NFC East isn't asking much. So I'm going to stick with the Cowboys. We'll move on to the NFC North. I've got the Green Bay Packers. I, agree. I don't think the Vikings are in for it. I don't think the Bears are, and I definitely don't think the Lions are. So week two will tell us a lot about the NFC North. I expect the Lions to, to lose to the Packers, but we'll get to that on Monday. I expect Minnesota to play a close game, but probably lose to the Cardinals. I expect the Bears to lose just because they're the Bears, and that's that's the reality of it, and the Packers to win. So, no, if the Lions win in Week 2, clearly the best team in the NFC North. No, that's that they're clearly not the best team in the NFC North. I don't know how you compare them to the Vikings or the Packers. Um, Kennedy, can you get rid of the spammer in the, in the chat, please? Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, didn't we ban them? I banned them. Like, what is this? I banned them at banned least them like once for a week. good. I do. This is it's ridiculous. Gotta be a different like. Adam, it's called making account. new accounts. It <laughs> says the same name every single time, it but does. whatever. Hot girls and boys video chat. Whatever. Anyways, um, NFC. A, uh, yeah, no, we're on the NFC. Sorry, uh, NFC North. Jeff, we got. Uh, I got the Packers mutually. We agree. Um, I, I just don't think there's any other teams in this division, similarly to the NFC East or or the uh, AFC South, that could really de- contend in this division. I got. Um, yeah, the Packers winning now. The win total, 
maybe 10 games, maybe 10 games, 11 games. I think the Packers go 10 and 7, 11 and 6, and they win this division. They went 13 and 3 back to back years. I think they take a little uh, uh, step down this year, but they still end up winning the division. I think it's just too bad not to. I think we mutually agree on that. Okay, fair enough. Uh, yeah, um, wow, I'm losing my mind right now. Sorry. NFC South. Yep, yeah. I got Tampa Bay. Uh, I have them in the Super Bowl as my pick. Uh, I think they win the division. I think, I mean, Jameis Winston's um, no joke, but again, you got Tampa Bay, the most arguably stacked team in the uh, NFL, along with the GOAT, Tom Brady, uh, entering his uh, 20-whatever season in the NFL. I think they win the division. Uh, I have them in the Super Bowl, so it starts with that. They get uh, a break before their, their playoff game, and, and they cruise their way to the Super Bowl again. Fair enough. <laughs> All right. NFC West, probably the hardest division in football to call right now. I'll let you go first, Jeff. Who's your divin uh, division winner and why, and how many games do they win? This was a very, very tough. Obviously, uh, you, you could put the whole NFC West in your top ten for teams, but this, after a lot of thought and consideration, I got to go with the Los Angeles Rams. I, I got it. On defense, they have the best two defensive players in the whole division, and in the quarterback spot, Arguably, I mean, you could put them up there with who? You got uh, there's Jimmy G, Russell Wilson, uh, and there's Matthew Stafford. Those guys are all upper echelon. Yes, Russell Wilson's better, but Matthew Stafford's no slouch. And with this offense, man, holy cow. Cooper Cup, Robert Woods, um, they're not a team to mess with. And I think on defense, they are solid. It doesn't matter who they're going against. They're going to make sure Matthew Stafford gets short field opportunities, and they take care of him when mistakes are made. So I got the Los Angeles Rams winning this division at possibly 12, 13 games. Oh, wow, 12-13? Because it's a tough one. I mean, the, uh, the CL, Seahawks. Rough. I don't see 13. I think 13 12. is too much. 12 is probably an excellent season for whoever the division winner is. I think you're going to see 12 win first place, 11 win second yes. place, and 10 win third place, yes. and probably 9 wins for fourth place. This is a tough division. I've also got the Rams. I think they're the most complete team in the division. The addition of Matthew Stafford, whether you like him or not, is an upgrade at quarterback for the Los Angeles Rams. They've gotten better from last year to this year. They showed it out week one. They're going to show it through the entire season, just how dynamic on offense they can be. All of last year, they were able to make only two, two plays, 50 yards or more, through the air downfield. Last year, the whole season, only two. First game with Matthew Stafford, they did it twice. They matched all of last season's total in the first game. The Rams are just going to be so dynamic. Aaron Donald already got a sack in his first game. He's going to continue to be the menace that he is. As long as the defense stays healthy, the, uh, like Cooper Cup can stay healthy. This is probably the best team in the NFC over Tampa Bay, in my opinion. I think they're going to grow over time. I like the Rams to win the division. It's tough to bet against the Rams. Kennedy, I know how you feel about Matthew Stafford. Yeah, give me, so give, me, give me your take on the Rams. Are they going to win the division this year? I think they're going to win the division this year. Why not? Stafford looks great. They all looked good. Every, the, nothing looks bad. I have their defense on my fantasy team, so I believe in them as well. But I think their offense is their strong suit for sure. But, you know, there's not really too many flaws that I see on the Rams team, so I don't, I don't see why they wouldn't win the division. You have Fair a enough. problem, Adam? No, I do not. I agree with that. Look, <laughs> guys, let's just, like, take our your bias aside. Bias the, just aside. leave your Detroit Lions support fandom on the side for one minute. Let's just have a conversation. <laughs> Who upgraded at quarterback this year? Was it the Rams or the Lions? The and please, God, if you tell me the Lions, I really can't take you seriously. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just trying to have a conversation right now. The Rams. The Rams no. clearly upgraded at quarterback, which, knock, knock, it's the most important position in football. And this is a football team that was carried by their defense last year, not by their offense. And they wanted, they won a playoff game because of their defense and their run game, in spite of their quarterback being hurt. So, with Cooper Cup back in the lineup, the Rams are the scariest team in the NFL, in my opinion. They're just, how do you cover Sean McVay's offense? How? How, how do you account for a Robert Woods, a Tyler Higby running down the seam, a Cooper Cup who can beat you on third down in the short game, he can beat you on the sidelines, and he can beat you over the top. Yep. And then the run game, they have to figure it out, but I, I'm not going to put it past Sean McVay who's been in the top 10 in the last five years in rush attempts. He is committed to running the football. They will get it going as the year goes on, and that's only going to make Stafford better. Again, it was week one against Chicago, but hey, just a reminder, Stafford's lost the last four games against Chicago. He changes teams. He wallops them on Sunday night football. So, you know, careful, careful what you wish for, Detroit. We got to go to break, Kennedy. 
We do. So we need to hear from Jeff about Lady Jane's. Next up, we're talking these guys' bets, which I know you want, so stick around for that. But Lady Jane's, Jeff, tell me about them. Well, fellas, uh, football season is finally here. It's time to make your grooming experience easy like Sunday morning. Get to Lady Jane's, haircuts for men. Walk in, relax, watch your favorite team play. And before you know it, your hair will be game ready. Get to Lady Jane's, open 10 to 8, seven days a week. Walk in any time because it's wicked awesome. Opa, introducing Papa Romano's new Greek pizza, a tasty blend of bold Greek flavors and Mediterranean toppings, including feta cheese and Greek dressing. Get a large Greek pizza for a limited time for $16.99. Order now at paparomanos.com. Hi, I'm David Hall from All Financial. With historically low interest rates and five-star service, you could pay your mortgage off faster without increasing your monthly payment. Get started now at 248-308-5000 or chat with us online. Callhallfirst.com. Welcome, everyone. You're tuning in to The Morning Wood on the Woodward Sports Network. Happy to have you here on a beautiful Friday. All right. These guys have their best bets of the weekend ready for you. So let's just get it going. Get your pen and paper out. Get all your apps out, whatever you use. Hopefully, it's my bookie. Get it ready. Here's Adam's bets for you guys right now. Oh, I appreciate the uh, the <laughs> setup, but it's, uh, let's start with Jacksonville and Denver. Denver five let's and a half Jags. point. De- Denver five and a half point favorites. They looked very good against the Giants week one. The Giants we saw them move the ball very well against Washington, who we can all agree has a better defense than Denver. Mm-hmm. But Denver shut down New York. So I'm curious to see how this game plays out. <clears throat> my bet for this game is going to be Jacksonville five and a half points. I like. I like that amount of points. Whether or not they lose, I could care less. I just don't think they're going to lose by a touchdown. I like Jacksonville. They've shown that they can score. Trevor Lawrence is going to have to throw for 250, 200, uh, probably 300 yards realistically to keep this game close. They, Urban Meyer needs to run the ball with James Robinson. Yes. You cannot avoid having that good of a running back and not giving him the attempts he needs. Get the run game going. Protect your rookie quarterback. And I think they cover... And I would definitely put the Broncos on upset alert. I think they they showed out week one. They're a team I think is going to show you a lot of inconsistencies this year. Bridgewater gives you some sort of consistency, but I'm not a fan of it. I think Denver has a possibility to lose this game. But I'm going to take Jacksonville with the points, five and a half, Jeff. Um, uh, you said Denver could lose this game. Uh, yes. And listen, on my bookie, they're a favorite all right, on the money line. They're, they're minus 270. Uh, Jacksonville's plus 220. So I, I kind of like Jacksonville's chances. I mean, you got Trevor Lawrence, who who looked good passing the football, besides the turnovers. In terms of fifty over 50 completions, moved the ball over 300 yards. Yeah, he had a couple picks, but he was throwing the ball from behind. He had to air it out, and obviously they knew what he was going to do. But coming into a Denver Broncos team, if he limits those turnovers and James Robinson gets going with the football, I think they have a better chance. I mean, the Giants just didn't stand a chance. This defensive front for the Broncos got after Daniel, and that secondary just completely tore him a new one. But um, I, I like the Jacksonville, especially at plus 220. I mean, I think Jacksonville can bounce back, go 1-1, one and, one, and, and the Broncos go 1-1. One one. Uh, I like their chances. Okay, I like it. My next game, uh, the San Francisco 49ers <laughs> versus the Philadelphia Eagles. I love this game. I'm going to take the Niners to cover the three points. That is, again, Vegas is telling me, we think they're almost a touchdown favorite against Philly, oh, in Philly, but we got to give the home team the three points. Here we go. They're a three-point favorite. I expect San Francisco to cover. They did a horrible job covering week one against the Lions. I don't think it'll be a blow, although I think this is going to be a, pl- a close game from minute one all the way to minute 60, but I do think eventually the Niners pull away, win probably by eight, ten points. We'll have to wait and see, but that's my best, uh, my second best bet of the weekend. The Niners to cover over the Eagles, Jeff. There's, I'm looking at two bets here. Like we got Tennessee Titans. I don't think they'll win, but that plus two thirty five money line is very intriguing because there's always a chance that offense clicks. But I'm gonna go with the Dallas Cowboys, the Los Angeles Chargers. Um, we have the, we both picked collectively the Dallas Cowboys to win that game, that football game at in L A. And obviously it could go the other way, but I like the Dallas Cowboys' chance, especially at a plus plus one sixty. I I think Dak Prescott in this offense is too dynamic to to count them out, and I think they come out and punch the Los Angeles Chargers in the mouth. I think they have to keep this game house scoring, and I think the Dallas Cowboys get it done in the end. So I like that plus one sixty money line because um, that was my pick. Regardless, You're taking the underdogs, huh? Yeah, I like it. Okay, I like it. Well, you are talking Cowboys, right? Yes. Well, this is my next one. I. I think a very good, again, let's just 
forget the team situations and how we feel about them. I'm getting a Dallas Cowboys team very similar to week one against Tampa Bay. I got Dallas at plus 340. And I was able to cash out early and win that bet. Anytime you can get a, a good football team, a team you trust on offense at an underdog line, you take it. And you cash out early if need be. Well, I like Dallas plus 160. I have to agree. I think it's a smart bet. And there's really nothing else to say on it. I think... I, th I really believe the Cowboys money line, it's, it's hard not to take it. It's so, it's so intriguing. Plus 160, there's money to be made there. Mm -hmm. you, you have to take this bet. I do agree. Jeff, your next bet. Um, honestly, the, the last bet I was debating on was um, between the Tennessee Titans and the Seahawks. But even though I just picked the Seahawks, I just think if you, if you throw any money on the Tennessee Titans, two, plus 235, like it, it, that would be absurd on the money line. But um, other than that... It, I'm gonna be honest. I don't really like any of these. Like, I, I'm not a guy. You you can talk about your bet, Adam. Your your spread and all that. Like, I, I gave my money line bets. That, that, right, my, that's enough. all I got. I got two more games. I got two more games. I want to discuss okay. uh, before we have to go to break. And I want your opinion on both of them. Okay. We're gonna go to college football for a minute. Michigan State versus Miami. I kind of hinted at this earlier, guys. Michigan State are the hotter team. They're the more complete team at the moment. That could change on Saturday, but. You're getting a team that you really think probably can go to Miami and win at plus 205. Again, money here. How are we going to make money over this weekend? It's easy to take all the favorites. But, okay. I, I like plus 205. I just, I like the number. It's, it's really favorable. I am taking state on the upset. Now, you could take the points and play it safer. That's fine. And I think, I think the safe... The safe bet is to take Michigan State in the points, but if I'm, I'm trying to make a little more money than usual, I'm taking Michigan State to win at plus 205. Jeff, what do you think? I love it. I mean, hey, if you can get a plus 205, um, you go for it, especially how this team's playing lately. I think it's a great bet, especially a guy like me who can't legally bet yet, but hey, a couple months, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm taking a bet. <laughs> All right, fair enough. My next, my next and final bet, the Rams versus the Colts. Now, I told you, the, the Colts lost week one. They're mm -hmm. probably going to want to bounce back and make the game closer. They lost to Seattle 31-17. They lost by 14 points. Well, what did the Rams do week one? They, they covered. They covered nine and a half points. And I expect them to cover again against Indianapolis, even if it's away. Why? Because it's only a three and a half point spread to cover. I think Los Angeles covers. I love this bet. Outside of, outside of the... <laughs> Outside of the Niners spread, this is like my favorite probably lock of the week. Like to take the Rams away from home against Indianapolis, who looked rough on offense, really couldn't move the ball downfield with their receivers. Mm -hmm. They were dumping the ball. I believe they, were, they played a very similar game to the, that the Detroit Lions played, dumping it all off to Naheem uh, Hines and Jonathan Taylor. You're not going to win in this league relying on your two backs to catch all of your balls. You need to be able to throw the ball downfield, the dig routes, the comeback routes, your seam routes, your, uh, your sideline routes. you got to be able to hit those. So for me, Rams three and a half points. I'm putting a lot of money on it. It's my favorite bet of the weekend. Jeff, what do you think? I like it. I, I agree with you completely. I think this Indian, Indianapolis Colts offense, especially with Carson Wentz, Listen, they took a step back. With uh, Philip Rivers had this thing clicking on, on all cylinders. So uh, Carson Wentz, yes, their defense is still solid, very much so. But uh, I like the plus three and a half. I think going away, it's only inevitable that this team, the Rams, win by two scores. I think it's going to happen or score ten points, whatever the case may be. I mean, even even if they win by four, yeah, that, that covers. If they win by two six, field goals, that yeah. covers. It doesn't matter. It's such a friendly line, and again, it Love is it. in Indianapolis. I, I do understand that, but. Indianapolis is playing a better team and a better defense overall than they played last week. I, I think this is a line that you're going to see move up. I would take advantage of it now. I think come game time, it's probably minus four and a half, maybe minus even five and a half. It's going to be pushed, guys. People are going to take this bet. I think you should take advantage of it. Uh, last week, I went. Uh, I had a rough day, I think, last, uh, last Friday on my uh, bets of the weekend. But I really think this is a perfect slate. I think this is 5-0, and oh, worst case 4-1 and one with the Jacksonville line. These are my five bets. I really like them. Kennedy, do you have a game you want to share with me? I, I know you're, you're all smiles right now. I, well, not a football bet. Don't tell me Jacksonville. No, it's not a football bet. I just said. I was, so the, the women's cup was in... 
Toledo. So I've been watching some golf. So my bet's going to be for the Ryder Cup, actually. And Europe's at plus 200. I'm betting Europe. Europe is underdogs? Yeah. They and should so, be favorites. Yeah, so I'm taking wow. Europe. Wow, I learned something today. That's a You're great welcome. bet, Kennedy. Thank That's a great you. bet. Bet on golf. I would, I would definitely take. Fun. I would definitely take Team Europe. They just always find a way to just beat Team USA. I don't yeah. know why. I don't know what they have against them. I don't know if it's psychological, but they always do it. You you can't you can't you can't bet against them, but especially yeah. at plus two hundred. Such yeah. a great bet. Europe's plus two hundred. The tie is plus uh, one thousand two hundred. Yeah, that's not going to happen. So, yeah, no. Definitely not going to happen. I'm taking right. Europe plus 200, though. Let's go, people. That's Fair my enough. bet. Of, that's my bet. Fair <laughs> enough. All right. So we've got to go to break. So, Adam, why don't you tell us about our friends over at Levels? All right. Well, speaking of Levels, we are actually broadcasting live today from Levels. 11 one Big D Energy will be down there. Joy Bell, Neil Rule, Darren McCarty at Levels in center line between... 9 and 10 mile road located on Sherwood. Come experience what everybody is talking about. Mention Woodward Sports to get an additional 10% off. And come meet the guys and have a good time. Darren McCarty is going to be there. The whole crew. We'll see you after the break. Bye. Would you like to win a custom built chopper while helping our veterans at the same time? Then watch as we turn this bike into a one of a kind classic chopper. Watch the Call Sam Chopper Shop on our social media channels and get your raffle ticket today at callsam.com backslash chopper shop. Morning, Is it time? Yeah, it is. Fish! Go fish. Fish back. It's fish! All right, we're back in the booth, everybody. It is, uh, it's a little weird to be here, but I'm very happy to be here. <sighs> we're all Guys, happy it's, fish. it's, 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 it's here. The weekend. I'm it happy, is here. I'm happy. Uh, Adam the, can the say whatever. Days of the week, not the band, in case you care. Uh, yeah, the weekend is here. We got a lot of football this weekend. Uh, we got the Ryder Cup next weekend, which I will be definitely hibernating in my house and watching. Um, it's in Wisconsin, by the way, if any of you care. Six hours and 45 minute drive from this location, which is You gonna make that drive fish? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Probably not. I'm definitely... It's in my brain hole. Consideration. Yeah, right. uh, we go to a video today or a picture today there was a lot of stuff to choose from that i found from yesterday uh and have you guys ever uh dm'd or messaged uh teams nfl teams or baseball or hockey or basketball teams right uh, yeah, have, I know you guys, about. have you guys done that before um like dm'd them yeah like maybe after a win you say congratulations no, at the I kansas mean, city chiefs i've dm'd like players like let's say if we drafted a player you'll dm them like hey man welcome to detroit whatever i've never dm'd a team to like ask anything i mean because uh, I, I never expect a response you know you really don't well this guy did dm a team oh Lord. and it went as expected this is brian campbell on twitter <laughs> who said at browns I know you guys lost, but is there any chance Owen could get a jersey? Oh. Cleveland Browns. Let's do it. Owen who? <laughs> Owen won. Let's go Steelers. And the Browns blocked him from Twitter. That's horrible. Hit him with that left hook. He said, is there any chance Owen can get a jersey? Owen who? Owen won. To the Browns Twitter account. And they blocked him. I uh, well, you know. I I think blocking is for the weak. Yeah, I th I would laugh. If I'm the, I, if I, I would never block anybody on Twitter, Instagram. Like even if, you could say anything to me, you're probably not getting a block. I I, I like to. Ignore <laughs> he it. said, "Oh and one, let's go Steelers." I love, I love that. I love it. <laughs> I love it. Oh and one, that's funny. What's next? Fish? We have baseball today. Uh, there was there was a football game yesterday, by the way, which we will visit in uh, a few minutes' time. We start with baseball, and uh, there has been more than six thousand instances of a pitcher striking out a hundred batters in a season. There have been three hundred fifty-four or three hundred fifty-one instances of a batter hitting forty plus home runs or forty home runs. Shohei Otani is the only player in MLB history to do both in a single season. That's crazy, man. He like, is doing everything. It's, it's never been done, and that's entertaining. I mean, that brings people who aren't interested in baseball into watching baseball. I mean, guys like him. He's the you got to be the face of the league, man. And he is the face of the league. Him and Vladimir Guerrero Jr. are the face yeah. of the league, even though Vladimir Guerrero Jr. There's tons Guerrero of young Jr. guys you can look forward to. 
There is, and baseball's going. They they want to capture the young audiences. That's yep. their goal. That's how you do it right there, getting dynamic players like that. I mean, it gets me intrigued. I mean, us, me and you intrigued. So yeah, it gets us intrigued, but they're also trying to tinker with the rules by having a guy on second base at the start of the 10th inning, which, mm, yeah, not a huge fan. I, I like those games where you're sitting down and you watch your seven hours, 18 innings of baseball, but I understand a lot of people can't take that. Speaking of can't take, Mr. Max Scherzer. Who used to be a Tiger, by the way, Yep. way back when. Now he is a Dodger. He was a national. Max Scherzer has a .88 ERA in eight starts with the Dodgers, with the team winning all of his starts. No pitcher uh, since his earned, uh, uh, runs earned became official in 1913 has ever had a lower ERA in his first eight games pitch with the team all starts. Yeah, I think Adam mentioned this um, a couple days ago, like just how, how stacked their bullpen is and just like how, like look at the Dodgers, man. They got Scherzer as what, their fourth guy? It's ridiculous. I mean, it's just, it's just how talented, how stacked this team is and their payroll we don't even have to talk about that payroll. That's, they won the, uh, won the World Series last year. They'll be in contention again this year uh, to win it. Uh, yes, Max Scherzer does have one blue and one brown eye. Yeah, it kind of looks... Very unique uh, trait of Max it's Scherzer. Do you know, I don't know how that happened. Is that just off birth? Or is that something yeah, it's, happened? Yeah, it's genetics. Yeah, just seen, genetics? I've, yeah, I've seen people with... Uh, it's kind of interesting. Each eye, different color. Yeah, but it's Usually rare. hazel green and a light blue. But you mean, don't see it cool. every day. You, I, uh, you know, fun it's fact. It's what, one in a million? Sick, oh, my uh, My left eye turns, like, light brownish, and my right eye stays hazel. When you're sick? Whenever I get sick, yeah. It's because you're not human? I don't know. It's just really <laughs> weird, but... No, I, yeah, I, I, that is odd. I, was a, I thought, always thought I was like, I don't even know how to describe it when I was a kid. It was like freaking Like, out. what's going on? What is this? Yeah, now I just accept it. It's like, all right, this part of whatever, whatever I am, I right. am. Here we go. Here is your football fact for all you watching the NFL football yesterday, not the Ohio-Louisiana Lafayette game that was another option you could have chose. Uh, the Giants, well, they didn't do very good yesterday. Uh, and Daniel Jones did not do good. He's the Giants quarterback. Uh, and he is not doing good in primetime games either. He has lost all six of his primetime starts in the NFL. No quarterback since 1950 has started their career with seven straight losses in primetime. The Giants' next primetime game is November 1st, and uh, they're at the Chiefs. You know what's Monday interesting, though? That that next primetime game uh, versus the Chiefs will be on Manning Monday, Monday night, where they, they commentate. So Eli will be commentating. Daniel Jones. So I, I cannot wait to see that that Monday night football game. But yeah, he's gonna remain on. He's gonna remain um, winless because he goes against Kansas City next time. But it was interesting because when they versed last night and they went against the Washington football team, he was four zero against them. But under, uh, he hasn't won a single game on on primetime football. So it was like two records like co- combining into each other of, of never losing versus Washington, versus never winning on Thursday night. So it was interesting and it, and it broke. He's he's uh. He lost, so we'll, we'll see. Uh, a friendly reminder, it's 9.52. Dave Gettleman needs to be fired. <laughs> cool. Next fish. We have birthdays today. We, uh, we have a guy you guys might love. He's a quarterback for a team who, by the way, was in that fact. Hint, hint, hint. Patrick Mahomes, Kansas City Chiefs. Hey, happy birthday, Patrick Mahomes. What does he turn? Like 20, 24? 1995. God, that's crazy, man. Oh, then he's 20, what? 20. Even 20. Let me, I'm going to look this up. I'm curious because he's still he's 26, so right? young. Yeah, he's 26. Yep. I'm 26 years sure. old. 20, man. 21, 26. Right. Yes. Happy birthday, man. See, it is his birthday. I wish people happy birthday, just not most of the ones you name. So is, is there a reason? Because they're not good? Uh, either I just don't like them, I don't care about them, or they're irrelevant. It's one of the three. Uh, we have two basketball birthdays today. Uh, I'm assuming you're not going to like this guy who I'm going to say first. But the second one, we'll, we'll do the Detroit one first. Uh, last week, I believe, last week it was Ben Wallace's birthday. This week, it is Rasheed Wallace's birthday. Hey, happy birthday, Sheed. So happy birthday to Rasheed Wallace. Sheed. And Adam, here we go. You might slander this guy. He was a coach. 1945, Phil Jackson. Oh, Zen Master. Oh, you liked him? Well, why wouldn't? Who wouldn't yeah, like Phil you, Jackson? It's one impossible. The, yeah, one of the best head coaches of all time. Um, what he did did like him in his what, Knicks era, but before yeah, that, yeah. But loved what he it. did with <laughs> what he did with the Bulls. Oh, it granted, no. Michael Jordan, but still, yes. like he he eliminated that narrative when he took over LA and he turned them into a perennial powerhouse. Yeah, and he they showed won he could do it with both. Championships after Shaq left. Yep. And then he went to New York, but you know, 
God, that was a, that was a mess. It was a mess. I just feel like his health at that time wasn't suited for him to take a job like that. And that's really what led to his downfall. His basketball mind is unmatched. You can't question it. It's just... Was he in the right mental state to be operating as the president of basketball operations? I don't believe so. And that's really what cost him. But I'm not going to blame him for that. I'm going to blame the idiot owner, J uh, James Dolan. Or J what's it? Jim Dolan? James Dolan. James Dolan. Yep. That guy, you want to talk about like one of the worst owners in the last 40 years? You put him right up there with the Fords. That guy is <laughs> yeah, absolutely, he's absolutely garbage. Awful. He's, he's actually at the bottom. Yeah. He is the worst owner in, across any sport. It's not even close. What else, Fish? Those are the facts. I hope everyone has a great weekend. I hope you guys enjoy all the football. What are you doing this football. weekend, Fish? Tell me about your weekend. I'm actually going to Ohio, the great state of OH Ohio. So I'll be down there for the weekend. Not hey, going to go, games, fish. but I'll be down there. I'll be watching the Michigan State-Miami game. I'm assuming that hey. uh, Miami will lose There's that game. There's UFC Saturday night. There is UFC that. Saturday night. By the way, did you guys hear about Notre Dame-Purdue that's happened this weekend? Notre Dame is not allowing Purdue to bring. Purdue has a big drum that they bring. Oh, the to the big, stadium, uh, the drum. Yeah, the world's largest drum or whatever. And Notre Dame is not allowing them to bring their drum. The, I don't know if it's Notre Dame or South it Bend. Fit? They're not allowing it. <laughs> I think it fits, awesome. wait, what but they're drum? not allowing wait, wait. it. They have like a fish. Explain it to him. Uh, well, I, it's a tradition. It's a they bang the drum. What do they do? It after touchdowns or before the game? Yeah. They have a big drum that they bring. It, it says Purdue. It has their logo. It has, you know, probably the. Uh, the birth of the team. And they can't the bring that the drum team. to the away game. Uh, no, it's. I think it's just Notre Dame. I think Notre Dame just said. Just said no, no drum. Ooh, you got a drum? Eh. They're, they're like the TSA. Ooh, it's over seventeen so like inches. That drum will five... interrupt our prayers. No drums. Too busy praying. Yeah, it's like the TSA. You can't bring a select amount of things. They're like, ooh, that drum is. Ooh, it's eighty-five pounds. Over fifty pounds. You got to pay extra. Damn, oh, wait, we're not letting you pay things extra. Things I'm ooh. looking forward to seeing in my lifetime. Dave Guttman getting fired in the next 12 to 14 months. <laughs> James Dolan finally being forced to sell the Knicks. That would be ideal. And, you know, I hope a billionaire comes across Detroit and, and buys the team, but we'll have to wait and see on that. Yeah. Verdict is still out, but... Maybe Bezos buys the Knicks, hopefully. Well, hopefully Bezos buys the Lions. That would yeah. be ideal. But... You buy a lot of things. We got one more quick fact. What's this up, is the fish? fifth season the Giants have gone 0-2. Fifth straight season. Fifth straight season the Giants have gone 0-2. Yeah, they suck, Fish. Daniel Jones is a lesser version of Eli Manning. He's turnover prone. He's he's like a weird looking. Uh, more he, mobile. He runs weird. More he's mobile. mobile. But... He's more mobile, but yeah, that's not a good thing necessarily. <laughs> yeah. He doesn't throw a consistent ball. I don't know. I'm I'm not a fan of Daniel Jones. I'm not a fan of Daniel Jones. A fish. What else you got planned for the weekend? Yeah. So it is. Sumo? It is. I will be watching. It is the world's largest drum, and they. Uh, the world's largest drum. Yes. Which wow, take pride in that. It doesn't really look like the world's longest drum. First time since 1979 that they will be without the drum. So they're going to be all off. They're all like, in like 30, 40 years, they don't have a drum. Sure. So we'll see if that, I mean, it's Purdue's, tough pill to swallow. they're going to South Bend, Indiana. It's not going to be an easy game. They'll probably lose, but. The drum is the key to success, Fish. It could be. Yes, Adam, I will be watching Sumo this weekend. Very excited. Day 7 and 8 over the weekend. You got a lot of soccer to catch up on, Fish, hey, right? I will be watching. Are you watching today's game at 3 o'clock? Who? who? Uh, Leeds and Newcastle. Oh, I won't be, Fish. I'll be at work. Well, it makes fish. sense. Fish. <laughs> but you have your device. Sell your device. No, fish. <laughs> I don't get distracted when I'm at work. Background. Why don't you just. Put on the mm -hmm. background, have the sound, you do your little work on your... Fish, I'm no? trying to acquire enough wealth so I can buy the Lions. <laughs> I don't have time to watch soccer right now. Well, make sure you watch them over the weekend, okay? Can you do that? <laughs> no? All right, Jeff, what are your plans for the weekend, man? Um, honestly, today we're, we're going to be at Dakota. Uh, yeah. Me, Easy, I uh, got my girlfriend going out there. So if you're in the 21-mile area, come to Dakota, see Woodward Sports. We'll be there for me, high school uh, football. Let me, uh, let me hook up Steve in the chat. Let me okay. just find my paper. All right, he's looking uh, for his Steve, paper. Steve, my bets... Get your paper or your phone out. I don't know what you need to get out, but write them <laughs> down. I've got Jags covering five and a half. The Niners covering the three. Cowboys on the money line. MSU on the money line. And the Rams covering the three and a half point favorite. Uh, three and a half point spread. Those are my bets. It's free money. Free money. If you want, rewind. You can see Jeff's bets as well. Uh, but that's going to be it for us today, guys. Where Thank do you, you so go to make those us. bets? Up, Where do you go to make those bets, Adam? You go to my bookie. You go to my bookie, Fish. No, you don't go to anywhere I, else. I appreciate the support, Fish. Um, we'll be back Monday 
We'll be previewing the Lions game. We'll be talking about Michigan and Michigan State, how they did over the weekend, how the Big Ten did overall. Right. Lots to talk about Monday. And, of course, we'll be live from O'Toole's for our Lions pregame show, live from Brass Rail for the Lions postgame show. It's going to be a great, action-packed-filled Monday. We'll see you then. Have a great weekend.